None received. None received. Okay, thank you. And Gemma, you have indicated that you wish to delegate your vote to Malaysia uh, as uh, for part of today's meetings. Are you content? Yep. Uh, has a notice been received from any other member who has delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under the temporary standing orders? Uh, declaration of interest. Uh, I have a declaration of interest in agenda item six, uh, and all members are obviously all members are obviously obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest committee. Jim, is that anything? Nobody. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I heard something. Any members to declare other relevant interests? Okay. Moving on to agenda item number three, victims' pension. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome the recent press reports that applications, applicants for the Victims' Pension Scheme are to open from 30 June 2021. The GAD report suggested that the processing of applicants, applications, applica applications should take several years, but it has thus been shortened from the short-term cost of the scheme can increase by around £30 million per annum. It suggested that members may therefore wish to discuss the likely financial profile of the scheme with officials later today. Is this agreed? Agreed. Uh, members, I uh, ask you to adopt the revised agenda, which is included in page four of the table papers, which includes an oral brief on the statutory rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, Fiscal Council, are members content to schedule a short closed session discussion at next week's meeting during consideration of the forward work programme in order to consider the committee's approach to dealing with evidence taking and engagement with the Fiscal Council or the independent Fiscal Council? Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. Draft minutes uh, proceedings the 21st of April 21. The draft minutes of the meeting on the 21st of April at page 7. Are we content this is an accurate record of proceedings? Chair, um, you and I are described as having declared an interest as co respondents yes. in the judicial review. We are applicants. All right. Correspondence has a rather different meaning, mostly in divorce cases. <laughs> <laughs> it's the member. <laughs> <laughs> I bow to the advice and guidance of my very learned friend from the quarter. <laughs> it's good to have a QC. We shall so amend that we shall so amend the minutes to uh, reflect that. Okay. With apart from that amendment, are we agreed? Great. Yes. There are no matters arising. Uh, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring officials onto the spotlight? That's Joanne and Jeff. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Chair. Hi, Chair. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Still on mute, Joanne. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not on mute. There's something wrong with the sound. Uh, Joanne, I think we've got you on mute. Yeah, I'm not oh. on mute. There's something wrong with the sound. Oh. Uh oh. Right. Stand by. All right, hold on. Yes, stand by. Um, Jeff, can you hear us okay? And can you speak to us? I can hear you and Joanne. Right, it's just uh, Joanne. We can't hear Joanne. Hold on, we'll ask. Bro well, I'll do the preliminaries anyhow, and we'll try and get you try and get you back up, Joanne. Uh, following a briefing in March, the committee agreed to invite officials to return in April in order to explore the, the final position in respect to the 21-22 budget. This will inform consideration of the main estimates in the Budget Number Two Bill 2021, which will come to the committee on the 26th of May 2021. I'd just like to say that the session is being recorded by Hansard. Uh, Clark's covering notice at page 17. The final version of the budget document is page 7. Uh, Department of Finance's response to the Victims' Pension Scheme is uh, 2122 at page 43. There is a correspondence from my party on ring fencing for health of the budget at page 45. That was the declaration of interest I made earlier on. Uh, correspondence from the Economy Committee on the Community, community Renewal Fund is at page 47. And the Department of Finance's monthly outturn and forecast outturn data for February March are at page 52. Now, let's see if we can get Joanna. I think she's probably tried to log off and back on again. Yes. Bear with us for a minute. Jeff, would, if Joanne can't get up, can you do the briefing? Yeah, absolutely, Chair. I'm happy to continue. Let, let's just give let's just go a few more seconds. I know. Um, Okay, Jeff, if you could, please. Thanks very much indeed. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to update the committee on the 21-22 budget. This budget will form the basis for the main estimates in June, and I hope that the previous sessions on the draft budget and this briefing session will help the committee in its deliberations on both the budget itself as well as those main estimates. 
After the announcement of the draft budget on the 18th of January, there commenced a period of consultation that ended on the 25th of February 2021. With the consultation responses and the departmental equality assessments informed the executive's decision on the final budget outcome. Since the draft budget was published, there were three main changes in the financial context. Firstly, a small amount of funding was released following reassessment of central items. Uh, this has been used to provide six million to TEO for shared future and 1.1 million to the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission to align its budget that uh, was agreed with the Assembly Commission. Secondly, additional funding for the executive was announced in the Chancellor's budget on the 3rd of March. A subsequent announcement of further funding for health uh, will also provide borne consequentials. And then finally, uh, Treasury agreed that some of the COVID funding provided in the later part of 2021 can be carried forward into 21-22. This is in addition to the usual budget exchange scheme amounts. Unfortunately, although this funding has been confirmed by Treasury, it was not confirmed by the Secretary of State in time and therefore could not be included in the published budget paperwork. The Executive has, however, agreed Jeff, some allocation. Jeff, 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 just a quick one. Has the Secretary of State subsequently confirmed it, or are we still waiting for that sign-off from the Secretary of State? We, we still haven't got any confirmation from the Secretary of State. Okay. Okay. Um, as well as uh, the Executive, however, had agreed some allocations that will be formalised in year. As well as significant levels of COVID funding, the Chancellor's budget provided an additional $4.2 million of resource bail from non-COVID measures. While this funding similarly cannot be included in the budget outcomes of departments, 1.4 million will be allocated to the Bright Start School Age Grant Scheme and DE. It will also fund the continuation of the public service route between Londonderry and London, up, um, about 0.9 million for that, and the translation hub committed to in the new decade new approach. The executive had previously committed to funding teachers' pay and safe staffing through the in-year monitoring process. To provide more certainty for these important issues, it is agreed that these costs will instead be kept up front from the funding confirmed for 21-22. The executive has also agreed to allocate 12.3 million to DOJ for PSNI staffing. Again, this will be met from the funding confirmed for 21-22. A further 6 million will also be provided to TEO for shared future, bringing the total to 12 million in line with previous years. 12.5 million will be provided to DFI for NI water resource costs. For most departments, the draft budget outcome re represents a flash cap, er, flat cash settlement, which will mean effective reductions once increased costs and demands and services are taken into account. Turning to COVID funding, the executive had allocated the majority of COVID funding available at the draft budget stage to the departments of health, education and the economy, leaving some 126.9 million for allocation at final budget stage. In its final budget, the executive has allocated all of that 126.9 million funding to departments, and these allocations are set out in the budget document at Table 4.2. The executive has also considered the allocation of funding made available since the draft budget. To allow departments to plan now, the executive has agreed a number of allocations which will be formalised in year. These confirmed in-year allocations are also set out in the budget document at Table 4.5. As set out in the draft budget, in recognition of the impact that COVID-19 has had on businesses and households, the executive are freezing the regional rate of domestic and non-domestic customers. In addition, the executive has agreed a further rate relief package, which will deliver additional support to almost 29,000 businesses in the form of a rate-free period for the next 12 months. This support will cost approximately £230 million and will be funded from the additional COVID funding confirmed by the Treasury. Other allocations from this funding include 9 million to tackle homelessness and 50 million to further support the health service. To help deal with the economic damage inflicted on the economy by COVID, the executive has allocated 275.8 million resource and 11 million capital to the Department for the Economy to fund in full the economic recovery strategy. 6 million is being provided to DFC for supporting people costs. There is also 28.3 million of funding being made available for the Department for Education to meet pressures in relation to recovery and support and re-engagements for children and young people. In addition, the executive has set aside some 81 million pounds to extend existing support scheme while lockdown restrictions continue to apply. The remaining funding of approximately 105 million 
And I think we have to give credit to you, Chair, for getting that number right in the chamber yesterday. No. Um, that, that may, funding may, may, will... I, may I note to my excellent card? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that funding will be held for allocation early in this financial year following a further assessment of health pressures. In terms of capital funding, the draft budget provided investment funding of $1.75 billion, including borrowing from its ORI facility of $170 million. The executive has now agreed to borrow oh, sorry, in the uh, 140 billion in the draft budget, and the executive has now agreed to borrow a further 30 million to provide additional funding to NI Water due to the strategic nature of its pressures, uh, bringing the total borrowing up to 170 million. This brings the total departmental capital allocation to almost 1.8 billion. This covers the key areas of the executive budget, and I am happy to take questions or allow Joanne to take questions. <laughs> I thought you might. Joanne, can you hear us now? <laughs> I can hear you, Chair. Can you hear me all right? Oh, that's brilliant. No, it, it's, I, I would hate to think you were missing the fun and all the rest of it. <laughs> I was just thinking Jeff's managing well on his own. <laughs> he doesn't need me. Yeah. Jeff and uh, Joanne, so whoever comes in, I'm sort of either more than happy for that as well. Um, sort of just a couple of questions. So now that the minister's statement refers to a budget of around 13 billion, is this now the new resource baseline for the executive? No, Chair, because uh, the, the total budget figure will include the COVID funding, and the COVID funding will be non-recurrent. Okay. So what's the baseline figure we're, we're working to? I'm going to turn to Jeff and hope that he has the calculation for that. Um, I think there's about $1.6 billion possibly of COVID funding, but not all of that is in that $13 billion figure. Jeff, do you have the figure for that? Um, I, I don't have it to hand. We can get that for you, Chair. Yes, please, Jeff. Just as we know what the new bit the new baselines going forward because obviously we're trying we need to be able to monitor everything above what the baseline is so we need to be to be over there as well uh, and thanks for your comments about sort of our our splendid mass and the rest of it because again sort of we realize that we believe there's sufficient funding available uh if we do our mass that we don't have to top slice departments uh to be able to support the victims pension scheme but again, one of the things we've been trying to get is, have you got any more granularity of what the sort of first year costs are likely to be? Have you had any more detail on that? We've had no more detail than we had uh, previously, Chair. Um, it's still estimated to be around 19 million in the incoming year, but obviously with the scheme open for applications, those costs will firm up once those applications start to come in. Okay. Um, and just some of the other sort of questions were coming up as well. I mean, obviously, the minister. We were talking about the sort of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Pay Award, and uh, what has been offered to the trade unions, and how we're doing it as well. Is there a cover in the budget for this settlement and for teaching and non-teaching settlements for the uh, Department of uh, Education within the budget? Departments, uh, Chair, will have built-in assumptions around the pay award for civil servants and for other staff. In relation to the teacher's pay, there was an additional allocation for the teacher's pay settlement, which is included in the, I think it's in the confirmed in your allocations as opposed to in the budget itself. Okay. And you mean there's an extra 30 million for Northern Ireland Water, and I know it needs a considerable amount of investment, but can you just refresh me how much of last year and this year's budget coming in we have uh, given to uh, Northern Ireland Water for its much needed uh, infrastructure improvements? Because there's, there's, I think, I'm just trying to stretch back in my mind. Can Jeff or somebody just quickly do the sums and see how much we've uh, passed over to Northern Iron Water over the last sort of uh, 18 months or planning to? Yeah, I think that maybe one chair would be better coming back to you on just to make sure we get accurate just, figures. Just, just a, it, we know it needs significant investment, but it would be useful to know that whether this is a significant quantum in dealing with its investment problems or indeed you know we're only sort of scratching the surface on it because again when we look at sort of future with RRI FTC and bearing in mind sort of the implications of the independent fiscal council and what we're what we'll be looking at I think that's quite important that we've got our, our heads around those that major infrastructure costs and where it's likely to come from and while we're at it we might actually have a look at sort of TransLink and sort of the amount that sort of TransLink needs to know as well because we've been giving, you know, it, and we have to keep TransLink going for all the right reasons. But we've been giving it in inter incremental chunks all over the various budget cycles we've had over the last sort of uh, 12 months or 18 months. So, but thanks for that. Anyhow, uh, Matt, Matthew. 
I hope I'm uh, audible for everyone. You are? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Jeff, and thanks, Joanne, um, for this um, and for keeping on top of it because I think uh, the complexity of COVID funding, the delay in getting it signed off at the executive and a whole range of other things mean that this year has been especially Byzantine and difficult to keep track of where things are. And I think that means that we are not able to scrutinize this as effectively as we would like to be perfectly um, candid. Can I just ask um, to confirm it for the committee? Mm -hmm. There was no resource underspend for 2021 whatsoever. Is that right? We haven't got the department's provisional outturn figures in as yet, so we don't have the outturn for 2021, but the fund, all funding available on the resource side was allocated. Um, while there will be some degree of underspend, we're not anticipating underspend which exceeds the amount we're able to carry forward under the budget exchange scheme, but we won't get those figures um, until sort of more towards the end of May. Okay, so that won't be known uh, for a while yet. On the 126, yeah. So the 126 million, am I understanding it correctly that that was, 126 million is the total additional money that was allocated between the draft and final budget, have I got that right? Yeah, there was 126.9 million of COVID funding, which was available at the time of the draft budget, but which wasn't allocated then. So it has now been allocated as part of the final budget. We have also then, um, there has been additional Barnett consequentials have, have been notified since then, but because they weren't, um, confirmed by the Secretary of State, we couldn't include them in the budget outcome, but the executive has made decisions on where they're to be allocated. And then as Jeff said, in open remarks, that that will be formalized in year. Okay, and that includes, the latter category includes uh, the 275 resource to, so the, the, the fact that the 275 to economy for the recovery strategy is not in the 126, obviously not the 126, it's more than 126. That's because it hasn't, it's been allocated, but not signed off yet by the Secretary of State. Yes, we can't include anything in the budget outcome that isn't in the figures uh, confirmed by the Secretary of State, but we do know that that money will be available this year because Treasury have confirmed the figures. So departments ha are aware that, that money is there and will be able to spend it. Why has the Secretary of State not confirmed those figures? I imagine just a, a timing issue. Um, you know, the, the funding was announced the Chancellor's budget in March, and then there was further funding come in at, of market consequentials after that. So the timing of the announcements of the figures and of our budget. Um, and in normal years, the Secretary of State would not need to come in and confirm the, the funding in between the draft and the final budget. It's just the timing this year. So I think it's, it's, it's I don't think there's anything sinister there. I think it's just simply a timing issue and the confirming of that. But, but the funding is there because so it's Barnet in the same way as we would normally get our Barnet. Sorry, Matthew, could I just ask a question there? So, sorry, Joanne, just for clarity, just so we've got that. So you've had confirmation from the Treasury about the figures. We actually have that formal confirmation from the Treasury what they're expecting to do. We've got yes, that. Yes, we do. Yeah. Sorry about that, Matthew. Just wanted to get that clear. That's okay. What does the Secretary State actually have to do? Does he just have to send you a letter? Yes. And and actually, um, well, we're we're taking legal advice on actually the, the terms of the, the legislation, but the legislation specifically refers to the Secretary of State confirming the funding and the Finance Minister laying a statement in the Assembly on the funding that's included in the budget. Now, this hasn't been included in the budget, but will be allocated then formalised through the in-year monitoring process. And to the best of our knowledge, we don't need a letter from the Secretary of State to allocate the funding that is available through the Barnett Consequentials in-year. The exception to that would be the uh, financial packages, the NDNA and the Conference of Supply Money, where we would expect formal confirmation to come through. Okay, but the, is the position the, the position as I'm understanding it is the two seven five among among other things, but specifically the two seven five is not included in the final budget statement because it has not been signed off yet by the Secretary of State. You are confident that it can be allocated because you have con because the Treasury have told you that it can, but it's not in the final budget statement. Though you can tell us it here today, and the Finance Minister can announce it to the Assembly, but because the Northern Ireland Secretary has not formally sent you a letter, it can't be put in the budget document. Yes, that, that's right. So, so we have it in the statement and we're calling it confirmed in your allocations because it will be allocated formally through the in-year monitoring process, but departments know they're getting that money, but it's not. If you're looking at each department's budget outcome in the tables, it's not included in that. So each department's budget outcome, if they've got an in-year allocation, will go up. And, and I suppose that 
uh, first of all, it's a fairly surreal situation, but I suppose it's only about the 20th or 30th most surreal thing about the Northern Ireland public finance framework. So um, we plow on. Um, the two on the 275 and the, for the economic recovery strategy, um, uh, how much detail have you had in the finance department? Is the economic recovery strategy basically the document that the Department of Economy published a while back? I can't remember exactly when, but they published a document. Is that what the 275 is mapped against? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, yes. And it, it includes the high street voucher scheme, 145 million for the high street voucher scheme. Okay, um, and and they okay, right, and then um, on the uh, you, just one final quick quick question on the two seventy five. Will that specific allocation have had to be agreed by the executive as a whole, or is that a decision for the finance minister having got the information from the economy department? Well, all of the allocations in the budget and the confirmed in-year allocations were agreed by the executive as part of their deliberations on the final budget. Okay, but they but they are but they don't come piecemeal to the executive. They don't say it doesn't. Each allocation doesn't go to the executive for discussion as a line item. It gets sent as a package, and the executive agrees it as a package. Well, the line item would have been the economic recovery package. It would have been split into two. Um, so the high street voucher scheme would have been shown separately and the rest of the economic yeah. recovery package would have been one line, so to speak. And yeah. that would have been agreed by the executive. On th Thank you. On the 13 billion, and you've obviously said that's, no, that's not the baseline. That's effectively the amount of resources being spent this year, but it includes additional COVID monies. Uh, so it, we are, it's, Broadly flat, but not quite flat. A little up because there's a bit, bit of it. Um, uh, but when we, given that that money will include rates income, which is being subsidized, the the how much? So what I'm asking is how much of the COVID monies is being has been used to, if you like, um, replace revenue that would have been locally raised otherwise in the absence of a rates holiday. The two hundred and Jeff will either nod or shake his head furiously at me that it's two hundred and thirty million for the, the rates holiday and that's the COVID money has been used to, to replace that. So so the total is it does that mean for the financial year 2020 twenty one, the total amount of the rates holiday's been two thirty two hundred and thirty million? Uh, based on current figures we have for twenty twenty one, yes, and we're estimating it to cost two hundred and thirty million. and uh, I am coming to the conclusion, I promise, Chair, just what calculation has been done on how much permanent structural loss there is to our rates income uh, going forward in that if we expect that there will be fewer, uh, sadly, fewer commercial premises, at least fewer retail units. I think most is now widely, I think that's a controversial statement based on uh, um, the consensus among economists there will in all probability be fewer retail premises on high streets everywhere how much are we expecting less um, rates revenue as a result on a kind of, in a kind of is it, does it take a structural hit right I'm, I haven't done I, we haven't done any calculations on that yet um, I assume it's something that LPS would be looking at but it's probably also very difficult to tell at this stage given the level of support that has been provided what the ultimate impact will be once that support comes to an end. Okay. And then final question, I promise here, is one of the line items in Table 4.2 uh, on COVID-19 allocations included, I think, which I guess is part of the 126 significant, I think the biggest single line item in the 126 is labour market interventions. What are they? There is, um, sorry, I don't have a complete breakdown in front of me. There's 20 million in there for the job start scheme. That would be right. the biggest element of it. I'm afraid I don't have in front of me unless Jeff has it, the, the breakdown of the other schemes. No, we, we don't have that with us, but 20 million for job start is the biggest element. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Jim? Yeah, just a couple of uh, miscellaneous points. I want to ask and get some information about the, um, the 400 million new deal. Can you tell us? What has become of that? Where that money has gone or going? That's the New Deal for Northern Ireland, which was announced by the Secretary of State. I'm afraid yes. um, we have very, very little information on that, that funding. 
Um, so it, there's none of it built into the budget. I do believe that the Secretary of State has maybe written to, certainly to the Department for Economy and I think possibly one other department, um, setting out allocations, but I don't have the details out in front of me, but certainly our involvement in it has been, uh, I was going to say minimal, but probably non-existent. So the, the sec sorry, um, the Secretary of State has written to the Department for Economy on two issues, uh, skills, uh, which he has allocated £15 million pounds over three years to, and Invest NI, which has allocated £8 million pounds over two years. I think the profile of the Invest NI wants still to be decided. Is, there, is it true or false that some of that money has been allocated to GB departments to assist food and medicine supply chain issues? I certainly wouldn't be aware. I couldn't comment one way or the other because I haven't been involved and I honestly don't know. Well, how could we find that out? Um, well, we'd have to seek that information from the Northern Ireland office. It's, it's they are controlling that funding, not ourselves. Person, the Northern Ireland Office wrote to the committee and indicated that uh, half the money had been allocated, so around two hundred million to DEFRA and to the yeah. GB Department of Health, England Department of Health, around the uh, uh, the uh, medicines uh, uh, supply chain and food supply Maybe. chain issues. But that was as much uh, transparency or visibility as we got. And Joanne, were you not aware? Was the department not aware of that? Certainly, we were. to think that if we had been informed it would have came my way so no I wasn't aware of that. So, so we have a situation where a new decade, I think it was a new decade and you approached that 400 million was it? No, no it's in the new deal for Northern Ireland Sorry. so it's, a, it's an NIO uh, funding mechanisms which is why we're not involved in it. Um, so and the, yeah, the, NIO the choice of titles NIO, isn't ID. The NIO trumpeted 400 million as a new deal for Northern Ireland, and we are now told that half of it went to a GB department, though to solve protocol issues or help alleviate protocol issues about the supply of food and medicines. That seems to be the situation. It, it certainly does, Chair, based on what I've heard today, or Mr. Alistair, based on what I've heard today. Would it be appropriate, Ms. Alistair, if we wrote to the NIO asking for clarity on the breakdown? Well, they've already written to us telling us that. Yeah, but so, should we ask them for further clarity what they're going to do with the other? I suppose. And um, do they think that that spend lives up to the billing that they gave to the $400 million? Anybody else like to uh, second that? Yeah, I'd second that, but I'll also add, because this, this came up the last time the uh, uh, Joanne and Jeff was in, in this committee, uh, and I did share concerns with them around this money and the transparency and the accountability of this money. Uh, so I do think we need to also ask around the rationale of the decision-making process as to how they allocate the money, uh, because there's all sorts of issues that here we know the struct we know in this committee the structure of finance and ministers making bids uh, or not making bids. Uh, is sometimes the case and the, the weakness in that. But it seems to me there's a fundamental weakness here whereby the NIO or maybe the Secretary of State ahead of the NIO or maybe someone within the NIO is deciding where this money is going. And it's nearly like a parallel process to our financial functionary. Uh, and I just don't see how that suits. Now, don't get me wrong. I'd welcome any money coming into Northern Ireland. Of course I would. But that's not my point point is the accountability of this and the yeah. decision making process. Yeah. And Chair, of course, that's 200 million to deal with REC border issues that this Secretary of State said doesn't exist. Yes. Joanne, just for clarity, sir, the monies would come through your department, though, for disbursement, wouldn't they? They wouldn't go direct no. to the department. There is no mechanism to do direct. that, is there? Our understanding was that they would have to come through the block grant through ourselves for disbursement, but again, we have had no engagement with the NIO on that process. But the two hundred million to DEFRA wouldn't come through your funds, would it? No, it wouldn't. It would go, I would imagine, directly from the Treasury to DEFRA. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, uh, I have two other uh, short Sorry. points. Uh, 
the money that the minister mentioned yesterday and Jeff mentioned today to the translation hub, how much is that? It's £160,000. And where does that hub sit? Under which department? The Department for Communities. Hmm. And is that, that's obviously for the financial year we're now in? Yes. And is that for infrastructure relating to a translation hub or for resource spending on the process of translation or what? Um, I'm not exactly sure exactly what it's for, but it is resource. Resource? Mm. Would there have been a business case for that? I'm not aware of... Uh, it's, not, it's not my side of things. Yeah, but there, there will need to be um, the appropriate appraisal done before they can spend money on that. It's just, as Jeff says, we, we're not aware of whether that has... Uh, it may or may not have to come to DOF for approval, depending on the, on the amounts and the delegated limits of that department. It's just remind me about the delegated limits. They tend to vary from department to department, do they? They do tend to vary between um, the purposes and for departments. I'm afraid I don't have a list of them um, in front of me, but they are all published and available. I think yeah. they're in a, a DAO, so we can certainly find those out. But yeah, so anything above those delegated limits would come to DOF supply for approval. But if it's below those delegated limits, it's approved within the department itself. Yeah. Uh, the final issue I want to raise, uh, yesterday in the House, and I want to make sure I got the answer absolutely right, I asked the Minister, was it correct that there wasn't a single penny in this budget to mark the centenary? And as I understood him, he said that was correct. And he further said that no Minister had asked for any money in the budget for that purpose. Am I correct about that? Uh, you are correct that uh, no one has uh, sought additional money for the centenary as part of the, the budget process and that no allocations were therefore made for it. Um, we are aware that some departments are possibly using baseline funding. Uh, for example, I think, Jeff, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Ulster Scots Agency is setting aside some of its baseline funding for that purpose. So while we can say that there's no allocations have been made for it because there was no additional money sought, that doesn't mean that departments aren't using their existing funding for that purpose. Would that would be within their delegated limits? Depending again on, on those limits and they will need the appraisals, but yes, departments have been given flexibility within the funding envelopes that they have um, to determine how that's spent unless they're given the money for a specific ring fence purpose. So if a department has baseline funding and it chooses to direct it to, in that way, that's, that's perfectly fine. So that would be presumably relatively modest amounts of, of money, yes? That, that would depend on the department itself. Um, departments have, when they, when they were given their uh, resource and capital envelopes in the budget, given basically free reign um, to allocate that as they seem fit, unless we were given the funding for a specific purpose. For example, the economic recovery plan would be for a specific purpose. But within their general funding, departments can allocate, allocate that as, as they see fit as part of that budget. But, but so, so they would need business case approval and that's so where delegated limits would come in. Yes, but, but so is that I'm absolutely clear, no department asked for specifically for money for the centenary and none was specifically awarded for that purpose? Yes, that's correct. So yeah, last night, after a busy day, Mr. Edwin puts in challenging uh, what I had said about that on social media, media said, I was shockingly wrong. Millions have been set aside. Have millions been set aside in this budget for the centenary? Not, uh, not set aside by ourselves in the budget, as say individual departments may have set funding aside, and he may also have been referring to the funding that the NIO is providing yes. for the centenary, which I think is three million. He might have been referring to that. It was clear my comments were relating to the Northern Ireland budget. Uh, yeah. Yes, there is NIO millions, three in fact, uh, but there's no reason to believe that millions have been set aside within the. NI budget as presented to the Assembly. In fact, nothing has been set aside. No, there has been nothing centrally set aside for it. That is absolutely correct. Individual departments may have chosen to set some of their funding aside for it. We wouldn't be cited on that. 
And how at this I point become, anyway. How could I become sighted of that? Um, well, it'd be something that we, either ourselves or the committee, would need to ask of each department. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, today. Paul. Yes, thank you, John. If I can take you on to the RRI uh, borrowing, I know that we've increased it from the draft budget position to a further thirty million. I recall that most members in this committee uh, signalled support for that move many weeks ago. So, uh, in a very high line base, I think that's common sense. Uh, given the borrowing uh, costs and burdens are so low, but have you have you done any figures as to the return on investment that that extra additional thirty million of borrowing will bring? In other words, will it free up development in certain areas, specific areas, and can we put a could we put a coinage, coinage on that as to how much it will free up investment in our building? Industry and other infrastructure projects. I suppose what I'm asking you to do is to, to, to justify the the extra thirty million of borrowing. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't have those, those figures. It may be something that the Department for Infrastructure could provide, um, and what that will allow Northern Ireland Water to deliver. But we we don't have those figures ourselves at the moment. Okay, so so it, it is. It, I'm right in saying that we can borrow up to two hundred million. Yes. But yet we we haven't borrowed two hundred million, so I think we're we're at one hundred and seventy million now with the, with the additional thirty. So you yeah. could argue that we're thirty million short of our of our limit. Uh, why are we not borrowing that additional thirty million then? Uh, I'll, it's sort of the same question, although yeah. only the other way about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, you're Who's absolutely right. We're, we're, borrowed, we're planning to borrow 170. Yeah. Um, we can borrow up to 200. So, there, so there is 30 million still available. And we did look, and departments did bring forward a number of proposals, and we assessed those proposals. And because the borrowing is a long term commitment, and yes, borrowing interest rates are low, but I think, as I mentioned previously, um, due to the sort of anomalies in the, the public expenditure system here and the way the borrowing has been established, actually, the, the repayment of the principal is also a cost to a resource there. So we, we need to be careful that the borrowing is for strategic purposes. Um, we also want to make sure that we're not borrowing a, say, a small amount for a, for a project this year, where actually the tails of that project are huge and may not be affordable in future years. So we haven't allocated that 30 million minute, but we have said to departments, it is still available and we are happy to look at further proposals on that. So we're not ruling out that we'll access that 30 million as we go through the year, if it's necessary. Um, and it'll also help when we get a feel for, you know, departments a capital expenditure profiles as well. One of the one of the other points that we want to make on this is that um, between draft and revised, we had confirmation from Treasury that we would be able to carry forward additional capital funding into um, 21-22. Uh, so currently there will be 64 million over and above budget exchange that will become available in year. So that will um, we didn't we felt that the, the need to borrow to the maximum capacity was slightly lessened because we can we have that 64 million available um, at the first monitoring round so that we can maybe see what flushes out then and uh, if we can if we need to utilize the borrowing after that we would so so the, the line sort of broke up there and, and my hearing didn't pick it up but so are we are we saying that there were other bids in uh other than the 30 million that we have increased uh to was there other bids that just didn't make the grade there, there were a few that, they, they were very very small small bids they, they weren't major um projects they were possibly the start of major projects so they were small and i think the point that jeff was making was one of the other factors that came in is we do now know that we've about 65 million or more of uh, conventional capital to allocate next year so we'd also need to look at that to say because there, there's absolutely no point borrowing if we have the capital funding to deliver what we need to deliver and there are capacity issues uh, as well it's not a, a case of, of throwing all the money we have at say northern ireland water because there's a limit to what they can deliver in any one financial year of course but it's something i suppose the key point is we will look at we will revisit this in year with the 65 million we have to allocate and if there is a good reason to access the 30 million borrowing we, we will do so there, there's additional money then going to justice for police staff. Where did that money originate from? 
Where was it sitting, or is that new money? It's the again. It's confirmed in your allocation, so it's part of the new money that we we are aware of. And as part of our just considerations between the draft and the final budget, we took into account you know the impact that the draft budget was having on that, and and made a, a further allocation. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Alicia. Hello. Yeah, we're here, Alicia. Yeah, okay, uh, Joanne. Uh, I was here. Fly to Rove and Sonia Shahri. She's very welcome this afternoon again. Uh, just a few weeks questions that I have. Uh, given the fundings and that, that are rather the different sources of fundings that we uh, can expect, whether it's the likes of the NDNA or the confidence supply and study deals and so on, um, how much of this is still outstanding at present? And to what extent, you know, is it maybe impacting on or, or affecting projects uh, which we know that uh, are there as priorities at the present time? Okay. Um, in terms of the specific financial packages, there's 306 million still to be confirmed. Um, I think I said out in Table 3.3 of the budget document, and then um, the additional Barnet um, there's uh, and carry forward, which we're waiting on confirmation. There's 959 million of that. But it, at the moment, that's not actually impacting because departments are working on the basis that that funding will be available. And I think, as I said earlier, in terms of the 959 million from the Chancellor's budget, additional Barnet consequentials. But those figures are figures notified by Treasury, so we're confident about the ability to spend those. In terms of the financial packages, the NDNA and the conference supply, we don't see that there will be an issue getting that funding, but we would like that confirmed as soon as possible. So it is the case that the work on that can continue uh, at the present time with the expectation that the funding will be delivered? Yes, yeah. and that's absolutely the basis that our staffs and departments are working on. Uh, just one other issue as well, too, in terms of the Department of the Economy, uh, and the future of the high screen, uh, high street voucher scheme, um, uh, which is seen as part of an overall package of recovery and so on. Where does that actually sit at the present time? As part of the as part of the budget, the executive agreed a confirmed in year allocation to the Department for Economy of 145 million for the high street voucher scheme. So the the ball is very much in the Department for Economy's court on that. The funding has been made available, and it's for them to roll out the scheme. Obviously, they will be waiting until restrictions are, are lifted and, and the high street can open fully again. And just in addition, then you know that other schemes as well, such as the payment not to care workers. Uh, and so on, and uh, and or even the student uh, support grants and that as well too. Uh, is that all dependent just on the departments themselves bringing forward uh, a date whenever they are going to actually pay this money out, or uh, is it in any way influenced by the Department of Finance itself? No, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, those two schemes are definitely um, in the hands of those departments themselves. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Pat? Then I'll bring that to you in the end. Thank you. Hello. Okay, I'm going to take them in now. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the presentation, everyone there, Jeff and uh, Joanne. Um, I asked the Minister uh, yesterday, I know that it was a flat budget, and he mentioned the 2% simply by inflation of 2.5%. Can the Department advise, can you tell me? What you are undertaking in order to drive down the resource costs and improve efficiency? Where are you looking at the cuts that are going to have to made come the springtime and the spend and review? Is that work ongoing at the moment? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so I suppose for, for this incoming year, where if we just set the budget for, um, it, it's over to departments to try and manage within the funding envelope that they have been given, and we'll engage with departments with that. But you, you rightly refer to the spending review, which will set our budget for the following um, at least one year and hopefully three years. And we will be commencing work with departments on that over the summer to look at what pressures and the impact of additional costs they have. Um, and we will be doing that. Uh, we'll kick that off before we have the spending review outcome. At, the point, at this point in time, we don't know whether the spending review announcement will be in the summer or later in the year as it was last year. But we'll start that work with departments because we have a good understanding of the pressures uh, and the issues facing each department. And then when we get our spending review outcome, we'll be able to 
look at those issues in relation to what that outcome, the funding that's been provided. But you're right, we're, we're not expecting a good spending review outcome. It's going to be a difficult one. And I mean, uh, taking in mind of, of where it goes to the shortage of capital, I mean, we're looking at maybe a smaller rate base or money which is coming in or even coming from central government. Uh, are you reasons to be concerned that that uh, as we move into that year after that spending review of the shortages and is there possibilities uh, just taking in mind that you've 170 million already borrowed I mean can that borrowing the, the money also be brought in to, to alleviate any pressures there might be uh, well we will still have the ability to borrow hopefully the 200 million per annum but what we also need to be conscious of is the cost of repaying any borrowing we undertake so yes um we're not anticipating or at least i'm certainly not anticipating a good spending review outcome and given that departments are already facing considerable pressures this year if you take the additional COVID money aside and that, that's very welcome but it's time bound for specific purposes uh, if you take that out of the equation it's a very challenging budget for departments this year and we don't think that's going to be any less challenging in the future years in fact potentially more so so yes i, I am concerned about the pressures that will be facing departments but, uh, difficult budget next year and the 200 million i would say would be a good result if that's if that's what the shortfall was i think you and i both know that it's going to be quite a lot more than that and that's my reason for asking what planning or where are you in order to try and be more efficient with where we are and those cutbacks do come in is that ongoing within the department we're taking that forward with the department as i say over the summer i mean it Difficult. There already have been over the past efficiencies made in departments. So all of those sort of um, quick wins or easy efficiencies, uh, to the best of my knowledge, will we'll now have been gone. So we now need to look at, at those more difficult decisions. And I've no doubt that there are difficult decisions coming down the tracks at us. But we'll, we'll engage with departments over the, the summer to try and get a, a feel for what those decisions are going to be and what the impact is going to be. Thanks. Okay, cheers. Matthew, you're coming in for a short one. Here. Um, can I just ask what the um, uh, total um, shortfall is in terms of EU uh, lost EU funding? Uh, what's the out for, in term for the full, full year budget 21-22? I'm hoping that Jeff has that figure. I don't have it in front of me. So obviously, in, in terms of the EU, we, ha we have had our, our farm payments um, basically replaced yeah. this year, but even even they are slightly short. Um, Jeff, do you have a, a total figure or will we come back on that just to make sure we get the right one? Yeah, um, I, I, let's let's come back, confirm uh, an accurate figure. But the ba it, would it be fair to say that the baseline is, um, the baseline of NI spending is reduced by lost EU funding? The actual, given the way that EU funding would, would have been scored, taking aside the farm payments, it, scored, yeah. it would have scored a sort of income so that you won't see it in the baseline figures as such, where yeah. you will see it is in department spending power being reduced. So um, I know Department for Economy are, are impacted, even though the farm payments have been replaced, um, the, not to the level that DEER would have wished. So each of those departments will be impacted, but you won't see it actually in the baseline figure as such. I think it would be helpful in that case, Chair, to have a, a, a clear figure in terms of lost EU funding and have it uh, broken down, uh, particularly this question of replacement in terms of farm payments. If we're not actually, we've been operating on, on the assumption that <clears throat> for at least the next few years, we're just going to, that money's going to be replaced by um, uh, HMG. But if that's not happening, I think it would be useful to know exactly what the quantum is. Yeah, I, I think rather than, uh, Give you rough figures now we'll come back on that so we're getting accurate figures for you okay thank you okay thanks very much indeed john and jeff as usual thank you very much indeed and thank you very much indeed for your sorry you disappeared off the screen there uh, thank you very much indeed for your uh, evidence session thanks very much indeed okay thank you thank you uh move on to item number seven oral evidence department of finance impact budget 21 22. uh stuart and janice will be coming to talk to us on starleaf uh, can Assembly Broadcasting bring up Stuart and Janice, please? This works. Hi, Stuart. Hello. Uh, Hello. Can you hear us? 
We can hear you, yes. Yeah, Janice, can you yes. hear us? Yes, can you? Yay, hear excellent. Thanks very much indeed. I'd just like to yeah. say that the session has been recorded by Hansard. The following are relevant to the agenda item. Uh, the cover note at page 160, the revised doc departmental briefing paper at 163, and there's a previous version of the departmental paper on page 109 of the tabled items. Uh, Stuart, would you like to sort of make your opening statement, please? Sure. Um, just to state from the start that uh, our budget position didn't really change from draft budget position. Um, we still have a current uh, baseline of 166 um, point eight, and that was the same as last year. Uh, in addition, we got allocation of 1.8 million for costs associated with EU exit, 1.8 for COVID related activities and 1.3 for collaborative procurement. Um, it doesn't include, and I'll come to that later on, the, the amounts that we would look for in year for the uh, continuing um, local restriction payments. Um, the budget, as you can see, the 172.1 there is, is split down below. We've provided a table there to show how it's uh, split across the department. And we've also provided some additional income or uh, uh, information on income and previous budgets uh, for you there below, but um, I, I won't go into that in detail. So um, from the start, which I mentioned last time, we the department has uh, identified as being a flat budget, we, we had pressures of around 16 million, uh, which we have sought to uh, manage internally. Um, so, some of those pressures, they include like loss of income from uh, land registry and general records office, increased costs and with the census 21, and um, some additional staff costs and areas of work like fiscal council, fiscal commission, rates rebate, uh, NOVA program, and moving to a, a three-year non-domestic revaluation. So uh, we have to date identified around 12 million um, of, of savings or cuts, depending on which way you want to look at it, um, through vacancy management, increased income and a reduction um, on a planned spend and maintenance of properties and also some cut back in, in um, existing um, projects. Uh, now, what we have tried uh, in conjunction with the minister is, is, is to look and ensure that those aren't impacting on frontline services. But even after that, we're left with um, a shortfall of around 4 million. Um, so we agreed with the minister that we would go into this year with um, an overcommitment really of around 4 million and, and seek to meet that shortfall in year. Um, and if necessary, take further action if, if that's not met through natural easements across the year. Um, in terms of, of COVID-19, um, as of the 19th of April, 272 million had been paid out. Uh, now, most of that is, is relation to last year, but I am aware that the um, committee likes to have an update on, on how much has been spent on that. Um, there's um, about, we will be paying out uh, the estimate for this year, but uh, um, is around 64 million. Um, so, um, about 246 of it related to last year and 64 to this year. Um, there's also the, the phrase, and I know you've discussed this already with, with Jeff and Joanne there as we yeah. were listening, the 230 million. So um, that doesn't actually hit the departmental budget. It actually hits the Northern Ireland block as such. So it's, it's more like revenue forego on, if you like, that you're not collecting rates in to go towards the consolidated, which um, helps to fund the Northern Ireland block. So that doesn't hit our, our budget, the um, rates holiday as such, that 230 million. Um, so, in terms of capital, uh, we have a net capital budget, 45 million, um, and the table below sets that out as to what those are for, or the, the areas that they're in. They're mostly around shared services and uh, IT projects, um, laptops, new services, um, some IT equipment in um, Northern Ireland Stats, maintenance uh, of buildings, etc., uh, and accommodation services. Um, and that's generally where it's from. So that, that's a, a brief overview. As I say, it hasn't actually changed much from last time we were with you. Um, so, but happy to take questions from yep. now. Okay, so Jim, do you want to go while I'm, I'm doing some maths here? Okay. Um, I think I read um, 2.3 million for the 
Fiscal Council and Fiscal Commission, is that correct? Um, uh, where did you read that? That's what I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> from the previous briefing. No, I, I, I think that's way over what we... Is it right? I Just think we're looking at around eight, maybe about for the year, maybe around eight, 800k, not... Okay. not uh, the thing that was really puzzling me is where is the... both the statutory authority for those appointments and the authority for expending money. Where, right. where do I find that? Well, at, at the moment, it's under the sole authority of the Budget Act, but they are it's intending the... Yeah, well, if you like to call it. Um, it was, was it we, black box? We, well, it, it'll be brought forward as forward uh, in the estimates for this year, or the, the budget bill, if you like, for this, for this year, which will be May time. Um, It'll be brought forward to the Assembly and then hopefully Royal Assent. So at the moment, but as far as the Fiscal Council, there will be legislation is being worked on to bring that forward in the longer term. The uh, Fiscal Commission will be more short term, nine to 12 months, so it will be totally relied on as far as the um, sole authority of the Budget Act. And so we wouldn't, we'll be we wouldn't have expected to have seen that, any reference to that in the spring supplementary estimates, would we not? Um, n probably not, uh, and that the spend will be this, this year, as far as I know. So nothing even in the carry over. Right. I see. Um, the other point I want to ask: the forty-five million capital spend. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of that was about. A, investing in Orchard House and James House, etc., and yeah. IT, is that correct? That, that's the main elements of it, yes. Well, I think we were previously advised that about half of that would be spent on the reform of property management mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. program. Yeah. Is that still the position? Um, yes, well, uh, there will be, because James House is part of the reform of yes. property management. Yeah, yes, and the refurbishment of, of agile hubs. Yes. So there is a, there is a big crossover between a property, uh, you know, PD and properties and reform of of uh, property management. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to hear later from property management, but uh, yeah. from a, a central departmental position, what's the assessment of the savings? if any, that have flowed from that project? Well, I don't have the full details of it, but I know that each, each time that they do spend money on it, there is a business case required. For instance, if there's a new building required as, as part of that or a new lease or whatever, that um, there is a, a, a business case done on that. Derek, when he speaks to you later on, will be able to provide probably figures on the, the overall performance of that reform of property management. It doesn't all come back, obviously, to um, DOF, the, the savings. A lot of the savings are captured within the departments themselves, but they will have an overall um, view as to what the savings are and the projected savings are for that. I wouldn't want to steal his thunder. <laughs> but is the department generally satisfied Oh, yes. I mean, I mean, I think we have certainly changed the direction and as part of the RPM board looked at, um, you know, where the savings were, because at one stage it was a much bigger project and looked at looking at buying maybe uh, buildings and things, but we moved away from that to be much more, reduced the programme considerably and, and it will be looked at again uh, after COVID and the new ways of working. So it's it's been reviewed all the time um, on the basis that they it needs to provide these to, to be savings and be efficient. So it isn't the case that this is just one um, project that just rolls out and blindly to what's happening around us. I think we, we're all aware now of new ways of working as prime example of where we're at the moment, a lot of us working from home. That's the, you know, that will... Is that there, will impact on, on the need for buildings and the yeah. type of buildings that we have. Is there any danger but, yes. that, that the new ways of working may not just supersede the programme, but um, cause one to conclude that there was some wasted expenditure even on that programme? Well, it, 
it's hard to tell at the moment until we get into what exactly the new ways of working are because I know um, Derek is also working on that project. We are looking at it. There'll have to be an assessment of how many people will need to be in the office and how frequent will be in the office. And that, that will certainly inform the need for buildings going forward. Um, and the fact of, you know, that, that, that was one of the main reasons as well, why the flexibility of the program, why we have a mixture of both leased and owned property so that if necessary, we can review when if leases, leases need to be re renewed or not or dropped going forward. So um, there is, there is all, you know, it, it is being looked at carefully as we go along and, and as the, uh, the environment changes outside. Do you anticipate asset disposals increasing? Um, there, 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 there are likely to be asset disposals going forward, particularly in smaller buildings, because I, I think we appreciate that it's probably cheaper at times to have lar larger buildings, and, and they may be taken out in leases, but that, that will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis um, as, as uh, areas are identified or whether staff are moved into larger buildings, and uh, that may vacate smaller buildings. So um, there, there may be uh, more disposals, or it may be a case of not renewing leases, and that, that, that will be carried out by um, Derek and his team and looking at, you know, well, what's the most cost efficient thing to do, sell a building or actually let a lease lapse and, and move more people into own buildings. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Alicia? Thank you, Rob. Uh, Stuart, uh, with Janice. You're both welcome, Stuart and Janice. Okay. Uh, just into in terms of uh, easements and the likes of it uh, that you are expecting, say, within the department uh, in order to meet the four million um, uh, overcommitted by the mm -hmm. department. Um, and how confident are you that that four million can be found within your own department? Well, looking on previous years, um, for instance, uh, this year we we had around a year about seven million of easements and resource. Now, um, we can't always tell exactly how that's going to fall, but that's why we will keep a close uh, eye on it. And come June monitoring will be the first stage of looking at well, where are we, and and we will renew the forecast from all the business areas. So, we are reasonably comfortable at the moment, but if it doesn't happen, then we will have to take further steps and stopping spend elsewhere um, to live within our budget, obviously, whether that might mean stopping other projects or stopping spend on, on or, or not filling vacancies, whatever. Is it, is it expected that uh, the civil service homes, you know, will be part and parcel of that uh, sort of appraisal as well? Um, and at, uh, in relation to the hubs and that, uh, to date, um, where, where do they currently stand and have you acquired all the necessary sort of accommodation that did you require for them? Um, well, a lot of the accommodations, existing accommodation within the, um, if you like, the Northern Ireland Civil Service property portfolio. So, for instance, Bally Kelly um, is an existing part of an existing property, as oh. is the one on Downpatrick. They're the two first ones that are opening. Uh, there are other um ones that have been identified up to about 10, I think. Um, I think maybe it's Balamina and Craig Avon later on. So there are, those are an existing properties, but there may be areas where we don't have uh, accommodation. And I know Derek and his team are, are looking and, and may have discussions with other uh, public authorities, such as the councils, to, to see if they can share accommodation with them. So the idea is to keep the cost down, certainly in providing the hubs. Uh, there may be some refurbishment costs and things, but in, in general, keeping the cost down on the hubs by using existing, you know, public buildings. Okay, Carmago, Stuart, thank you, Stuart. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Stuart. Just a quick one. Just looking at there was a previous uh, report you sent through to us. I think it was on the nineteenth of April, and it was on COVID nineteen funding. And I'm just sort of trying to tool up the mass here. And I'll just read the paragraph to you. COVID-19, during 2021, Department of Finance has been heavily involved in the delivery of COVID assistance payments to local businesses. The extent to which those activities will continue is currently unknown. That's We all understand that. And will be kept under constant review. Current estimates are at around $48 million per month. And this will be dealt with, with by in-year monitoring, with funding being considered separately by the executive. Can you sort of outline if that's still being planned? Because it's not 
in the report you've just given us. So is that gone, or what's what, what's been planned around that? Because I think that you know we do the maths, and that's 576 yeah. million this year. I'll, t I'll take a step back on on, on this, actually, because um, I think uh, this year we had up to about 246 being paid out on the local restrictions um, to date. And then there's another 178 million relating to last year as well that hasn't actually go to, gone out, but it will be accrued into last year. That's for the larger NAV and larger organisations. So... Um, that point there. This year we're estimating about 64 million at the moment. Uh, I think about 25 million's already gone out, and we we're expecting another sort of 39. But again, we don't know. Um, that could continue on depending on the situation. Uh, I don't know if that provides you with any more clarity. So say we had 246, I think last year, plus 178 that will accrue into into. Uh, last year and then around 64 million has been estimated for this year which we don't have in our budget but we will be looking for that jeff mentioned about the 81 million that's been set aside and we'll be looking to avail of that so the 81 million that's been set aside you're already ring fencing 64 million for that as potential for continued support yeah okay right yeah. okay thanks any other questions okay. too Okay, Stuart, Janice, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers, thank you. Bye. I think got Morris McCarthy's on the line, Chair. I see. Can we bring Morris on? Morris? Uh, hello, uh, hello, Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hey, excellent. Hurrah, thanks very much indeed. Everybody, this is the next item in the agenda. It's public sector reform. Uh, Dr. Morris McCarthy from the Senior Lecturer School of History at Queen's. Uh, the session has been recorded by Hansard. Clark's briefing note is at page 172. Morris's paper on public sector reform is at page 178. Morris, would you like to sort of make your opening statement, please? Sorry, did you say to go ahead, Chairman? Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear. Sorry. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, well uh, thank you, Chairman and, and members of the um, committee for the opportunity to engage with you. I, I, I can't remember the last time I put a, a tie on, so um, uh, was, I was going to put on aftershave, but I thought that was going a bit far. Um, so, uh, yes, indeed, as you say, I'm from um, the school, actually, it's School of, uh, as you can see behind me here, History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics, so quite a large school in Queen's. Um, but I teach public administration and politics here uh, in Queen's. So, well, the first thing to say is, I, I mean, I, I do think you deserve some congratulations. I've been listening to the evidence you've been receiving and uh, you, like public sector reform is a deeply, deeply important issue and the quality of um, public services determines in large part, you know, the quality of, of citizens' lives. There are other factors at play, of course, but it's, it's deeply important. So um, I guess I was thinking about, to use a, a medical analogy, I mean, we like to think of our body of being in some way in good condition to resist um, COVID-19. And if we were to think of that for our administrative systems, it's the same idea. You, you want them to be in good working order and to be able to to respond to new challenges and and um, uh, crises or attacks uh, as they arise so I've sent a, a note in advance I tried to give new information rather than to give go over ground that you've already heard but I'll run through it very quickly and I'd be happy to take any questions I mean uh, I'll be very summary um, the first I've, I've made a distinction between uh, what you might call public sector broad whole of government reform and then civil service reform uh, as a distinct uh, issue within that so uh, the first thing to say is that public sector reform is is an enormous issue. Uh, it means uh, different things to different people. Um, and uh, that runs a danger, of course, that it can, it can end up meaning nothing, you know. So we need to be absolutely clear when talking about reform or when setting a reform program, um, what exactly it, it is that is believed to be in, in need of reform, um, what needs to be started, what needs to be stopped, what needs to be changed, and so on. Um, there does seem to be strong international evidence um, for reform to be vested in some form of central coordinating, overseeing authority with political clout um, and with some form of sanctioning powers so that people, you know, have a concern about not doing the reform. There must be some sort of sanction in place for that and some sort of, some sort of long-term commitment as well. Um, I know the Irish case of this very well, arising from the financial crisis. I've, I've written a book about the reforms, which are quite remarkable um, in and of themselves. Uh, things happen that people said could never happen. Um, but this is true internationally as well, where you have a strong centralised uh, authority to oversee uh, cross-government reforms. 
Uh, there are costs, usually upfront costs. Reform is not cost free, so there are usually financial costs up front. But there's also opportunity costs as well. And it's a very, it's a question that's not often asked in terms of reform. Um, you know, you might be better off hiring 100 new people rather to, than engaging in a process of, of reform. So you must really think about the commitment and what else would people be doing if they weren't in, in the public service, if they weren't engaged in, in reform. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, criticism of silos, and that's a, a kind of a constant in government. I mean, um, in a strange way, I sometimes defend silos. You need to organize your government some way. Um, and the issue really, and again, COVID points this up, it's, it's about developing mechanisms of working across government, uh, what we call in the literature transversal mechanisms or horizontal mechanisms. Um, because when you look around the world, the countries that were most successful in dealing with COVID uh, societally were not the wealthy countries necessarily, places mm -hmm. like Vietnam, Senegal, Bangladesh, they were able to mobilize their whole of government and their societies to, to address um, the pandemic uh, much quicker than, as I say, wealthy countries that didn't have such systems in place. Um, and we must, again, the experience of COVID has borne this out, that we must be alive to the, the, the sort of omnipresence of digital data now within government. Um, it's, it's all pervasive in, in the engagement between citizens and the state and between public organizations themselves as well. So gathering data and making sense of intelligence in real time is an ever more valuable skill in the public service and something that needs to be think about in respect of recruitment and so on. I'll turn quickly to civil service reform, if that's okay. There's yeah. just some broad stroke things on public service reform. Um, so I've heard a lot of debates about generalists and specialists. Again, that, that it's, not a, it's not a new debate. It's a debate worth having, absolutely. Um, but my experience, um, I'm talking to people from, you know, well, certainly in the European context, but internationally, colleagues who studied this as well, is, you know, every system contains both. Um, you know, I've yet to come across someone who's a it labeled a generalist who isn't actually a, a, the skilled person in their particular area, um, skills that are acquired over time, because many public service jobs or civil service jobs are unique. There aren't private sector counterparts. And similarly, what you tend to find is people hired in and skills based systems tend to need to learn those generalist skills to move around and to engage and work in the difficult environment that is the civil service dealing with, you know, the public dealing with political um, uh, bastards and, and so on as well. So you need a combination. I'm not at all saying don't recruit skills skill, uh, people on the basis of skill, you, you, you need that. Um, but you also need to think about um what you're going to do with them. And I've, I've watched, as I mentioned, the Irish case of cloaks where on the back of the economic crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. the only part of the public service to do any recruitment after 2008 because there was an embargo was into the, uh, was was economists um, because there was a belief there was, uh, and this is very similar to the RHI story, there was a belief that there was a, a, a gap there, but you need a career stream. Uh, it can't be just hiring in 100 people and that's it. There needs to be a, a pathway within the system. Otherwise they dissipate into the generalist and, and they move for promotional purposes. And, and so on. But, but civil service reforms are really totemic. Uh, they send very important sim signals across the public service system in terms of things like terms and conditions of employment, but also what's being prioritized, what the political priorities are. Um, it's also it also set standards for the for the private sector as well. And I should note, I, I, I did listen to the Public Accounts Committee, your, your um, sister committee is having a discussion about the, uh, I think it was in December, about the range of staff in the Northern Ireland Civil Service acting up. And I mean, this, is, this should be part of this story as well, of course. Um, just be a little bit of caution um, about reforms. Um, I again refer, you know, sometimes reforms can lead to new problems if not thought out. So if I was looking again at the RHI inquiry reforms, uh, sorry, recommendations, some of them are, are no brainers, you know, about, um, um, you know, good record keeping, good handing over of um, um, files to, to from departing staff to new staff. Um, some of them I would see as slightly more problematic. I mean, it, it's quite open when you say things like, you know, notes of significant meetings between officials and ministers must be recorded. I understand the premise of that, but, uh, you know, on what basis do you, you, you know, every public administration or every civil service system in the world, uh, you, you will have some form of informal engagements between um, senior politicians and senior civil servants. That's just the nature, you know, informal chats. Uh, so, for example, do you document every one of those and what sort of difficulties is that going to raise for the, the relationship between them? Um, so, I'm just using that by way of a point that sometimes uh, reforms can, can lead to unintended uh, consequences. Uh, and I know the Northern Ireland Audit Office is looking, reporting on this, so I look forward to that report and to what the recommendations are. Um, 
good recruitment, retention and development. I'm coming to the end here. Um, a, a lot of talk about getting people into the public service, and that's true, but keeping them in there is a, a big issue as well. And, and talent management, um, succession planning, and I would suggest a good investment in training and development. Um, I think it's a wise investment. I mean, we talk a lot about an investment on a bridge or a motorway over 30, 40 years, but, but when you apply the same logic to the people you're bringing into the public service, and they need need to be developed and trained and opportunities should be there, budgetary opportunities to do that. Um, just consideration be given, I, I think this is overlooked a lot to, to the, the insights that frontline public servants can bring to the reform agenda. Often reform is very top down. Um, again, just my reference to the Irish experience, there was a very interesting exercise where the top civil servants went around the country and, and engaged in, in private meetings with people from across the Irish public service and, and got very frank and fair and interesting messages uh, from rank and file civil servants about what they saw as the problems within the system. And it's a very cathartic experience, very useful useful experience about hearing from people who are you know, doing the job about what could be formed. And finally, my final point would be very much that the civil service should get into uh, a mode of open engagement. I know this has begun, but I would be, uh, uh, you know, strongly counsel some, for, some form of systematized open policy forums, discussion with outside experts on the development of new policies, new legislation, and so on. I think this could be quite productive. And of course, I would say this, the universities, of course, would be very open, open to this. So I, I I hope I haven't spoken too quickly. I hope there's some food for thought for members there, but I'd be delighted to try and respond if there's any queries. Chairman, thank you. No, thank you, I think one of the, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your evidence. Look, one of the issues we have had is um, we have had in front of us, we have had a, um, a senior civil servant who was brought in from Whitehall, who regrettably she's leaving Northern Ireland. And yes. uh, she yes, talked a lot about times, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. She talked a lot about skills shortage. She talked a lot about the age profile and the fact that we've got a very aging sort of civil service as well. We talked mm -hmm. about sort of how we need to change the culture. And, you know, there was a, a sense that we needed to have somebody centrally to drive that change process. And obviously, if you look at the sort of the models that we've had in other areas, it was driven very clearly from the head of the civil service. But yeah. unfortunately, she was not selected to be the uh, head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service seems to be quite successful in getting a job back in Whitehall at a very senior level. Uh, I'll not go yeah. into the details of that, but the reality is that now they're proposing to replace one head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service with two with slightly ill-defined patterns. And, you know, looking as a, an intelligent outside observer, I mean, one of the things that you're trying to look to is to see intelligent design and how you're going to change the culture and how you're going to make the system work. And, you know, one of the issues that I see here is, you know, who are we going to get to drive it? Where is that sort of impetus going to come from? And the other issue is, like, the one of the things I quite find very surprising is the lack of cross-pollination between sort of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the rest of the sort of the GB Civil Service across the board. There doesn't seem to be very much movement and we don't even have any fast streamers within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which I find very surprising. You just comment on some of those and, you know, if you were going to design the system yourself, would it look anything like what you're seeing now? And you yeah, can say well, that because, you can say that because you're an academic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chairman, you were dipping in and out there, but I, but I, but I heard the relevant points. And yeah, I mean, uh, um, no two systems are are the same. Of course, we we um, we we borrow, we learn from from other systems. Uh, sometimes it's it's not such a good idea to just copy what seems to be successful in one context uh, straight across to another. Um, you know, I think it was raised very well by Anne Watt two weeks ago uh, from Pivotal when she spoke about this uh, about the, the the fact that. Um, you, do, you do need some central driving force and something with particular clout. Now, um, the, the, at the current setup where things reside in the Department of Finance, um, is it's okay, but they're, they're not, you know, the people there are not being asked to lead and to, um, to drive reform as such. Uh, and there might be something to be said for, for example, um, that this committee would recommend that the executive office in, in the next government or something like this would, would have a specific unit close to the heart of political authority, close to the office of first minister and deputy first minister. And that public sector reform would be um, on the agenda. Now this, because this is a big driver of behavior, you don't need to bring in some guru, for example, from the private sector who reform and, you know, a large organization, but often what happens is they come into a, a public sector organization and can't understand 
the political environment at all and, and leave. Um, instead, I, I think that if you design a system in such a way that there's strong motivations for people to engage with reform, that there's some concern over, um, you know, that there are sanctions in place. Um, I mean, what happened if, if you, if in 30 seconds, what happened in the Irish case after 2008 was the Department of Finance uh, was split in two. So the Department of Finance traditionally brought in money and spent money. Um, it was split in two. The, the spending side, the expenditure side was merged with the public service reform side and the um, the industrial relations issue and created the, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, which is almost exactly 10 years old. And that department was the central, its remit was to reform the whole public service and it had very strong political authority. There was a cabinet subcommittee set up on public service reform and no public servants wanted to be called before that committee to say why they hadn't, it, it, why they hadn't implemented their reforms. So design is important and I think um, like it's a relatively small system, the, the Northern Ireland Public Service, it, should, it shouldn't be beyond the weight of man to design a, a unit, for example, within um, the executive office that would drive, um, um, that would drive reform and have the sort of systems in place to oversee a, a politically agreed public sector reform agenda, which, which it should be possible to achieve agreement on because everybody wants good public services. Um, does that make sense? Sorry, I, yeah. you dipped it in, in and out no, a little bit. And I'm aware of the, the, the story, of course, of uh, the cross policy. I've quite a number of students who I teach students who wish to work in the civil and public services. And um, some of them have gone on to the fast stream in the GB system and done very well. Uh, they've, they've come back on um, uh, recruitment visits and, and so on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Matthew? Um, thanks for coming giving us evidence. Um, Not at all. The, the, the thing you just mentioned about your students who want to go, some of them who want to go and um, work in the fast stream in Whitehall, mm -hmm. um, some of them may want to go and work for, uh, in Marion's, how many of them are actually are interested in going and joining the Northern Ireland Civil Service? Okay, oh, that's a good question. So I would, uh, just by a simple example, so I do a, a final year module, I would have anywhere between 20 and 30 students. And uh, I usually say, by the end, I've convinced a lot of them of the merits of the public service. So I, I, no, absolutely, I would have a handful who don't want to go too far and who would want to work in, uh, well, you name it. I mean, I have people who maybe have, you know, worked in the in the emergency services or, or but, but, the, but the civil services is absolutely of interest to a portion of students in politics every year. So, um, but, just, but, yeah. yeah, you just said something which, uh, forgive me if, if I'm being too Freudian, but you said in answer to whether you had people who wanted to join the civil, Northern Ireland Civil Service, you said they didn't want to go too far. Is that why they want to join the Northern Ireland Civil Service or is it that it's a, an exciting place to work in which they think they'll get things done? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I see, I see where, where, where they might, they might say they might be gotten uh, London or Dublin or yeah well there's a number of good studies about why people enter want to enter a civil service career and quite often and i do find this a lot of students you know want to contribute to society now for personal reasons they might not be very mobile and and so they they want to enter and a question i'm asked all the time is can you get me can will doing this course help me get a job in the civil service of course i've no i've no control over that um but uh, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily be aware of it i think um um you're right. Like as somebody says, like children don't grow up saying one day I want to be a civil servant. You know, they want to be an astronaut or a doctor and so on. But a lot of them um, do engage with this idea of wanting to to contribute to society or to make a change in society and so on. Um, but, but we're not talking huge numbers here. No, but, 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 but I mean, I take the point. But obviously, I mean, uh, yes, though people, no, very few people, you know, nine year olds don't want to become civil servants or for that usually accountants or PR professionals or, you know, uh, um, social workers that whenever they as they progress through school they say i'm interested in politics i'm interested in policy i'm interested in public service and and, and it becomes a but i'm not you know perhaps especially capital p political as someone who was a civil servant for a while uh, but it's not capital p political um my que my question though is do you think and i you, you're an academic i'm not asking but do, do you think there is do you observe a difference in the ambition level of the types of people the Northern Ireland Civil Service is attracting relative to the, the ambition level of types of people who might want to join, go to Whitehall for a, or any other civil service. Mm. I'm just trying to think of the, the individuals involved. I wouldn't want to I'm cast any. Answer. Answer. I'm not going to be demeaning yeah. of any individual. Of um, course. The point yeah. I'm making is that uh, there, um, there does seem to me to be a structural issue with Northern Ireland Civil Service and its ability to attract 
yeah. um, uh, to attract people, bluntly. It's far too old and it does not attract enough um, yeah. people. It's not an attractive enough workplace. Is that something you would, would you agree with that depiction or am I being unfair? Uh, no, I mean, the uh, fast, fast stream is absolutely attractive. So the absence of a fast stream system is definitely an, an, a, a disadvantage. Uh, but you, you would see students who would, and this is, this would be probably true internationally, I would say, I mean, you would see the civil service as a very, uh, you know, as a steady job, a, a reliable job and so on. Um, and well, I like to think by the end of my courses, you know, they realize it's an exciting job, you know, all life is within the, the civil and public services. So, but uh, I, I understand what you're getting at um but uh it's look it's i'm not talking large numbers here it's very hard to put a, an account on or sorry a, a a figure on it um but i i think yeah certainly in terms of the pr the profile of the northern Ireland civil service wouldn't be seen possibly as dynamic as the uh, as the the british the the, the home civil service necessarily yeah. so 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 just on, on your on your other point i, I won't take up too much time chair but on, on sure. your, your point you made about um uh, the creation of public expenditure in Dublin and how that had now that came from a particular moment. A new government came in, and um, I believe this. I mean, this was after the troika had already been. This was there was a as it were burning platform. Um, uh, so you, you can't really get much more extenuating circumstances than that. Um, it, is it uh, is it those kinds of sort of, as it were, you know, major huge shocks to a government that real reform is born. Yeah, it's an excellent point. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the I mean, the the background to the creation of uh, Deeper, as it was known, Department of Public Expenditure Reform, was the, was the troika and the need to effectively slim down the state. Now, there's there's a fair chance post pandemic that we'll be facing into similar sort of territory of you know efficiency cuts are being talked about it and so on. And you don't want to create a crisis. Nobody wants a crisis, of course. Um, but I don't fully buy the you know absolutely crises do drive behaviours. But I don't I do think uh, there's plenty of examples of excellent reforms. In fact, there's several recent books on successful public service reforms in non-crisis situations. Um, and I was trying to relay some of the ingredients that seem to work. So we're talking here about, you know, good, sensible plan, you know, a plan that everybody understands, that is communicated, that has good leadership, that has measures and all these things you'd be familiar with. Um, uh, so I, I do think serious reform is absolutely possible. Uh, two, two quick follow questions and I'll turn it over on the chair. Um, one, is it the case so you mentioned an issue and this is obviously an issue for us as finance committee because it's our job to scrutinize mm -hmm. the finance committee is responsible for effectively civil service policy and public sector public reform policy mm -hmm. but it is not really seen uh, it doesn't seem to be owned as a kind of core function of the department it is a core function of the department but it's not it doesn't feel like it's at the core of the department sense of itself and uh, would you say that you know it, it feels like a spending department? It's not. A, I mean, it, it is not a true finance department that doesn't really raise revenue, other than in a couple of limited areas. But it, yeah. it it feels much more that the core of the department is spending, managing the public spending framework. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And, and I would know several of the individuals uh, working in there and they're, uh, you know, excellent people. Some of them have come and spoken to my students about their work. So uh, absolutely zero criticism of them. But it's more about the what tends to happen. And you find this internationally is that because a, a lot of issues around uh, uh, public service reform get tied into terms and conditions of employment and so on, that they end up in the in the employer courts or the, the minister for finance, as it were. Um, but what you see is like, I guess, like any policy issue that to have serious clout and to for it to take on a new life um it tends to be coming from when it's in you know a prime minister's department or in this case the executive office or a new a new standalone um and a new department even uh, as i've mentioned um so yeah it, you know it, as it sits within the department of finance the worry is that it becomes very much associated with um um you know uh, just 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 spending issues and so on rather than you know engaging in in cultural reform or, or innovation and i do recognize that you know there have been serious attempts at the innovation labs here um mm -hmm. for over several years and if i need to ask one really brief final question and then i promise is the last one what um uh we had a reduction in the number of departments uh, a few years ago from, uh, I think it was 11? Yeah, to nine. To nine. Has that had any measurable impact on 
has that been a positive in terms of public service or reform? What, uh, has that had any measurable benefits other than the efficient, other than efficiency savings? Uh, well, you've two things going on, don't you? The, the the sort of that structural reduction, as you're talking about, and I, I know you've heard a lot of evidence about the reduction in the number of, of, of personnel. So you've had this sort of slimming down. Uh, th- there's no ideal size of departments or anything like that. I imagine it. It, it makes at a very practical level, you know, for smaller interdepartmental committees, it's easier to get messages across and all that that sort of thing. Um, but um, do the, the danger of that is that that it, uh, major policy issues get lumped in together, and uh, you know it gets harder for them to get get profile and, and so on. And I'm very conscious when I say that um, in the context of public service reform. In fact, I saw somebody talking about in, um, in Scotland, the Scottish debate at the moment mm-hmm. around having a ministry for COVID recovery, which sounds like you know uh, quite quite a sense idea um but i haven't seen any assessment uh, other than you know people have been asked to do more and more yeah. there's, there's there's fewer people in the public service but that's that's true internationally in a, in a lot of cases as well okay thank you thanks for thank you okay thank, thank you, you very much alicia i've got chair of this fashion all for it uh, 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 i was interested just one of you commented there at the very outset that uh, some of the um, countries that had dealt with the uh, pandemic most successfully and rapidly uh, Mm. were uh, some of the Asian countries in particular maybe uh, was the very fact that there were more authoritarian type countries in the first instance or was it within their system a a degree of authority that allowed them to sort of cut across bureaucracy and or silo and the partners within their whole structure uh, and, uh, and if that is the case you know uh, how can we actually instigate that here we'll say within our own system yeah it's a uh, excellent point you're right i mean you know people often talk to the successes of some some countries and their public service reforms till you point out that they're very authoritarian regimes where the you know the civil servants are in in control as as it were um and and china is the runaway story here isn't it where its reaction was you know militarily enforced which we would deem unacceptable um in certainly in the western world so um but there, there's a wider point though and i'm working with some colleagues um a, a project on responses to the um pandemic and what you do see is you're right quite a few authoritarian uh, non-democratic countries but but plenty of democratic countries too and it's about being able to use um gather information very quickly um good coordination of intelligence systems uh, lots of different types of data spatial data and so on um that was used and in fact you see this now more and more across the european union closer to home with the like there's measures now of the increased use of artificial intelligence in in governments and again i do think this should be part of your discussion on public service reform um you look at small countries like estonia denmark are sort of leaders now in artificial intelligence using uh, online systems for for dealing with major major crises and particularly has to be said climate change the climate issue like when this pandemic recedes we've got an even bigger thing looming at us you know um but your point is very well made about yet yeah, like non-democratic regimes can do things um without necessarily the accountability controls we would expect and the this sort of the citizen voice being being heard um but we've all seen the the consequences of that mm-hmm. Well, well, within our system here in the north of Ireland, what would you suggest we actually need that would um, uh, allow that same degree of authority, we'll say, within any unit or department uh, to, uh, that would uh, facilitate uh, that type of rapid response, such as in the case of a pandemic, or that would facilitate good government? Uh, yeah. So- yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm always surprised how quickly civil services respond to to sort of um, what, what what we call wicked policy crises, you know. So, like I, again, I know I keep referring to like I would have seen the Irish case up close when there was uh, the 2008 crisis, but the public service responded really, really quick. Well, similar here with the with the pandemic. I mean, I know there are various cross departmental teams, good people working very hard um, to to deal with it. But what you're referring to is like you know it, it shouldn't be reliant on this you know. Uh, informal you shouldn't need a crisis necessarily to have good um uh you know good quick agile government um so i i guess i'd refer back to my earlier points about having some central system that has good kind of um what would I call it, uh, good mechanisms for communicating across the public service, including local government. I mean, we don't tend to think enough about local government and local authorities when we talk about public service reform. Um, so, 
you know, there's no like there's no silver bullet with this. I mean, as I said at the start, it, it like the, the the shape and uh, nature of a public service system is well. Actually, I didn't say this, but I should say, you know, is it's it's been going on for, since since Plato. You know, what what way should government be? What way should government be organised? But we can't ignore this kind of um, this huge beast of sort of digital technology that's there now that should be making things easier in terms of how we address complex uh, policy problems which which most policy problems really are nowadays you know um working uh, across government departments sorry yeah. Yeah, without just say drifting into the field of politics in a sense but given uh, our structure here in the north of ireland you know for at times we can seem to have responsibility but without the authority really yeah. that, uh, the changes that we would think the, that that are needed uh, I respect what is at local government level or, or, or central government. Yeah, you're right. And, and you do really have, I mean, it's horses for courses when you don't necessarily have, for example, in the case of finance, when you don't have full autonomy over tax raising yeah. and so on. Yeah, your, your options are more limited for sure. But there's still, you know, there's any amount of, of um, lessons and ideas going on that can be that can be learned from uh, around the world um, at sort of, you know, devolved regional levels and so on. You, you know, you can do some things, um, but that's why, you know, I think it's really, you know, it's something this committee is very appropriately doing and, and engaging with. Um, but I, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a, um, a perfect menu of, of. Well, there are menus out there, but I don't have the right uh, recipe necessarily for you just at the moment. So we're owner them. Morris, just a just a quick one um, before I bring in uh, Jim Allister. Uh, you talk about algorithmic governance, and that obviously refers to digital government and the process, the rest of it. I remember yes. being in Estonia just after the wall had come uh, down. Yeah. And yeah. asking, they were asking questions about, you know, how do we do basic governance? And the bottom mm -hmm. line was because the Russians had left and taken everything with them. It was absolutely started from nothing. So they created yes. everything. So the digital route was the easiest way to do it. Yeah. And over the years, when I've asked questions of, particularly when Whitehall and I worked for the Ministry of Defence for a long period of time, you know, when you're asking about digital reform, what you're doing, trying to make better systems, you know, using early examples of AI and all that sort of thing. But the problem was, of course, you were trying to mold that on and weld that onto an existing system, and the two wouldn't yes. work. Basically, they will not talk to each other. So yeah. high in Northern Ireland, where we have multiple sort of systems, IT systems, different sets of data, you know, we one of the problems we have, we don't even seem to account for things in the same way. In some areas, we have different processes than the rest of it. Yeah. You're nearly saying if you want to get algorithmic governance working right, you have to put a, a line under it and say you, you nearly need to run a new system and build that up while you're running the old one and you're running that down and just take yeah. out of the old one what you need. That's an extraordinarily bureaucratically complex and expensive way of doing things. So have you yes. any particular thoughts on that? No, this is this is a really excellent points, and you're you're just right. I've I've spent a bit of time in Estonia, and um, you 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 absolutely hit the nail in the head. I mean, they had this bizarrely this advantage of having nothing, and they were able to build a system. Um, I mean, they're they're very conscious of Estonia of, as kind of effectively an enemy. You know, the Russia on their doorstep. I mean, they don't even have soldiers on the border because they say, "What's the point?" Instead, they invested in in technology and to secure their systems that could survive any sort of um, cyber attacks and so on. But they're they're, they're one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of how they deliver public services to citizens. So every citizen has this digital card, gives all all information about them. They don't have the same privacy concerns. In fact, they share their data with the Finnish government. A lot of people commute every day from Tallinn across uh, the, the the sea, which I've forgotten the name of, over to um I beg your pardon, the Baltic Sea, of course, uh, over to um, Helsinki. So they share data with with another sovereign government, as it were. Um, but you're right. There's, you know, you can't. You, you kind of um, you've you, you've come so far with a system. It's very hard to sort of just stop and and start afresh. You can't. Um, um, I've been talking to some of my computer science colleagues uh, about this very issue. And actually, Belfast City Council are doing a bit of work. I'm sure you're aware of this innovation quarter, and they're they're dealing with this problem at the moment. So there might be some useful discussions to be had. Uh, are looking at how they're seeking to create and use digital technology for the good of citizens in, in Belfast. Okay. could be more broadly applied. Uh, but it is certainly one for another day. It's a, it's a complicated issue and, I don't, and, and expensive as well. Okay, thanks. Jim? 
Do we need a separate Northern Ireland Civil Service at all? Wouldn't a major reform be to blend it into the Home Civil Service? And that would give you all the open career paths that we people presently feel restrained about, and it would give you access to the total skills base that sometimes we're criticised for not having enough of. Is that not yeah. something we might think about? Yeah, so uh, ignoring the, I'm, I'm sure there's some um, legal barriers to be overcome to that, but in, in theory, um, merging merging systems, yes, it, it does allow. So again, if I, if I could draw on the example of the Irish uh, public service, where there was a, a kind of a, a barrier between the civil service and the wider public service, but one of the reforms introduced in around 20, 2009, 10 was this idea of mobility, that people could move uh, between local government, education, health system, uh, and so on. And it did, so So yes, you, you would have a more open labor market. However, the downside is, of course, you, you possibly would become, you know, you'd have less autonomy over tailoring um, aspects of conditions and terms and conditions of employment to, to local need. Um, so I can, yeah, I can see some merits, but I'm just trying to think here ahead of what the downside to it is. And you might lose that local specialism that, 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 um, or local autonomy over particular needs, you know, that you'd be, um, you know, um, would your voice be heard in terms of um, the, the, what's appropriate for the civil service, what new type of, uh, you know, if you need more people, um, but do you have to one of the, was one of the major criticisms of Sir Patrick Cochrane that he asked yeah. the very poignant question, was Northern Ireland big enough, civil service-wise, to have the capacity to even run yeah. the RHI scheme? Yeah, it was it was a good point. Yeah, and the like that any area involving um, things like the telecoms, energy, any of these regulation. I mean, it's it's um, it's difficult. It requires people with specific skills, as 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 he mentioned in the report, um, and. Yeah, you know, one of his recommendations was you need to make sure you have the the people to do it. So, um, but I mean, there's no there's no barrier such though, is there? When you, like to somebody from you know Liverpool applying for a job in 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 Belfast in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, um, or am I, I I could be wrong on that? But um, no, there isn't. You know, uh, other yeah. than they might think that it's um, not money. a very big pool in which to progress. <laughs> Right. Okay. No, I, I accept your point. Yeah, and um, okay, yeah, promotional opportunities are are important for any any civil servant. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. You, you, you mentioned uh, Plato uh, a while back, and it was Plato who said, "Never discourage anyone who continually makes progress, no matter how slow." Uh, and and we hear. We also, no, also say there's nothing new since Plato. Yeah. So. We, we 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 hear. Sometimes get East, really yeah. annoyed about how cogs turn so slowly. Uh, yeah. And I suppose I talk about the culture. There seems to be not only a, a lack of speed in most things uh, and development of policy, but there's this risk averse nature. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure it's right across the world. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's the default position of civil service right across the world. But how do we get beyond that? I, I've sat in public account committees where I've been asking questions of officials and what I really want them to say, what I really want them to answer me when I ask them a hard question is, look, we took a risk, yeah. it didn't pay off this time, but we learnt so much by that failure that we now know how to proceed in the next 10, 15 years. And I never get that answer. I never get yeah. that answer. And that really annoys me. But so how do we get around this culture whereby we've got, we've got a risk averse default position and the cogs always turn deliberately slow yeah it's a, it's a great question you're right it's 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 not unique uh here like it, it's an inter, it's a an international question uh, um we have a line where we say like one one um person's red tape and the slowness of the bureaucracy is is another person's protection you know and and um you know against the the ill use of public funds or poor decision making and so on but often red tape accumulates over time because it's the product of previous problems and new rules and regulations have been brought in and so on where, where there seems to be some um room for uh, what you're talking about is where for example um 
uh, civil service organizations set, set aside things like innovation budgets where they say, look, we want people to experiment, to try new things. If it doesn't work, fine. You know, we're going to park this money over here because most civil servants are told, be innovative, do things differently. But my goodness, when it comes to the public accounts committee, you're going to be, you know, it's, it's all on you if things went wrong. So there's this kind of fear of straying too far or being too innovative. So I would say that in, in defense of civil servants, that um, the, the sort of incentives often, particularly for promotion and so on, like, do you want to be the person who, um, you know, tried something that was a spectacular failure, you had good intentions, but that, that sort of stalks you around for the rest of your, your career. Um, all I can say is, you, you know, it is a culture thing. You develop this over time. Uh, not, I'm not talking about decades, but if there can be an understanding but between political principles and the administrative system that, you know, you're not going to be um, punished or you're not going to be passed over for promotion and so on, um, for trying to do things uh, quickly, of um, trying to respond in a more speedy manner. That can, that can develop. You can get into a virtuous uh, cycle, as it were. Uh, but the systems of financial accountability are, are, are possibly out of date as well. There's been a lot of moves internationally towards, I'm sure you've heard of this, performance budgeting. So looking to see, like, let's not go down to every sort of um, line item, but look at the pro like projects, look at big picture things. What was achieved? Uh, what were the outcomes? Rather than saying, you know, let's go through line by line what each, each um, you know, pound was spent on. But it's a yeah, it's it's a perennial issue. Um, I'm I'm not sure if that's given you any more food no, no, for thought. You, you have. I am drawn to your paragraph in your submission here where you talk about groupthink, and anchoring, and yeah. confirmation bias, and I find that really interesting. I on the groupthink piece, you know, I think it was Patton who says that if everybody's thinking the same, somebody's not thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, no, that's it. And and uh, on, the anchoring, the, on the anchoring piece. We, we see it nearly on a daily basis here, whereby the truth's out there with regards to fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes departments will, will get a, a report and run with one, and then they'll get another report that maybe would counter the facts in the first initial report, but yet there's this anchoring or this confirmation bias whereby they do not yeah. adjust and, yeah. and they ignore the second report and they run with the first, even though the evidence may well suggest that they, they're at least their information and facts are at least subject or, 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 or subject to error so, or suspect. Yeah. So, so that seems to be a massive problem and it seems to be worse and amplified whenever, as Jim has said, you have a smaller scale uh, civil service with Sometimes. lack of capacity. Um, yeah. and, and I don't know that how you would ever get round the fact that people are just ignoring fact. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you picked up on that point. I didn't go into it. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but a big development over the last decade has certainly been the, the application of psychological insights into decision making in public services and all these issues about how we, we sort of say what we want to believe and, and so on are really important. And I would just I think a way around it is, you know, you really do need to bring in sort of um, external, uh, uh, different uh, voices. Uh, what what you call um, uh, uh, dissenters, uh, in effect. Uh, so people who might say, um, you know, challenge, challenge things, in effect, and say, well, I, I I see the world differently, or or you know, the basis on which you are assuming something is wrong, uh, and that's been that's been really successful in in sort of avoiding you know, massive waste of public money and so on. Um, and I, I, you know, I, th I think, as I said at the, at the end of my sort of opening remarks about uh, opening the civil service up to outside voices and expertise and certainly, you know, okay, I, I work in an institution where there's any amount of people working in lots of different areas who could perform that sort of function and say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Or on, can you justify the basis on which you're taking that decision or, or to, or, you know, it, the case you're referring to, there's two reports, I think I heard you say, and with two different two different opinions. Um, so to try and come to some resolution or decide what's the best um, avenue to pursue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks thank very you. much indeed. Any others? Okay, Boris, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just, a, just a final one. Um, yes. Just get out your crystal ball gazing piece of here. All right. <laughs> it's on the shelf here behind me. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed, <laughs> exactly. Um, do you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about our ability to make the necessary reforms we need to 
in the next one to two years to be able us to deliver what we need. Okay, um, so I know two weeks ago there was a discussion. I think about the isn't is the assembly elections and the program for government. So I, I to be honest, I'd be I'd be very optimistic of you making um, a very useful, uh, I, 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 a very useful, important contribution to an agenda for for reform. But I, I'd really encourage you to think sort of short, medium, and long term. There might be some immediate things that you, you're aware of could be done, but it's about um, putting in place. Um, ideas and a direction of travel um, um, that's that you believe is going to shape sort of the future of the civil and public service. Um, so some of these things we've been talking about about digitalization and um, re recruitment, um, training and development, and, and so on. Um, possibly some ideas about the way in which public service reform should be governed, the governance and regulation of public service reform. Um, so I, I'm optimistic with good reason you know i think even your discussions you've identified you sort of know what a lot of the problems are which is which is great so so all we need to do is fix it yeah 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 but listen but, you, but i i think i would say i mean i've wrestled with this for years i've worked in like various capacities of governments there is no there is no single answer it would have been found by now it's an it's it's always changing you know in, in line with the way democracy and government and society is always changing but but precisely what you're doing now is a very important um role i know it's maybe not electorally this is what i always say the politicians i know who who really sweated and you know put their heart into it then to, didn't get re-elected because we were you know there's no votes in reform or something like this but it is yeah unfortunately it's um it's uh, very important work so okay. i wish you well and I, like, i'll be happy to follow up with any anybody on or anyone on these thanks things. very much indeed. martha mandy take you up on your offer as uh, we uh, if we're still here next week and we uh, and we move onwards We'll, we'll keep a keep close eye on it. And when we start getting the shape of what public sector reform is going to be like, we'll be looking to further work on that and sort of bring people back in to have a look at that as well. But thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Chairman. All the best. Bye Thanks, yeah. everybody. Cheers. Uh, next item on the agenda, item number nine, Department of Finance Reform of Property Management Programme. This was deferred from the meeting last week when we didn't actually have a paper, but uh, we had a wonderfully read out script but we needed the opportunity to look at some of the detail with this as well. Uh, the briefing notes at page 185, the departmental briefing papers at page 191, ministerial statement on connect to regional hubs is page 196, the NIAO report managing the central office of states in page 119 and uh, 99, sorry, Northern Ireland asset management strategy is page 263, and the state of the estate, sorry, that's a bit of a front office. The State of the Estate Report 2012. This is page 341. Uh, can I invite uh, Starleaf to bring on Derek and Patrick, please? Good afternoon, Chair. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Derek. Okay, can I ask uh, who's, who's making the statement? I'll, I'll make the statement. Uh, okay, Chair. go ahead, Derek. First, First off, can I offer our apologies for the confusion of last week? And I will I'll make a very brief statement. Uh, I took up enough of the committee's time last week and, uh, uh, and then open it up to, uh, to, to your questions. Um, in short, the, the program was set up to deliver uh, the, the recommendations of the executive's asset management strategy uh, and their key objectives. Uh, we have a goal to be an efficient shared ser property shared service for central government, uh, where we help to realize some of the PFG outcomes as well. Uh, in, my, in my briefing and in the briefing paper there, there was a, a, a key moment in 2018 where we've changed our approach to investment and we created an investment strategy. Uh, and there have been some key interventions since then as a result of the investment strategy, namely the acquisition of James House, the acquisition of the short-term lease at uh, Nine Lanyon Plaza, uh, the refurbishment of Orchard House, uh, uh, to name a few, and, uh, and a pilot in, in Goodwood to test um, using the estate differently uh, by, by changing the way we work. Uh, you'll appreciate since COVID, we've had to reevaluate that uh, investment strategy, and we're currently in the process of refreshing that investment strategy, maintaining that hard, robust approach to asset management and using asset-based science in the development of our objectives. 
uh, but also wanting to realize larger program for government outcomes in regards to addressing regional imbalance, uh, promoting economic recovery, and uh, pr promoting local regeneration as well. Uh, and that, that work is ongoing. It is definitely uh, factored into our thinking into the future. Uh, and likewise, uh, we've, uh, we're embarking on a program of using, to the extent possible, the government freehold the state more effectively out within uh, regional, regional towns and cities so that um, we can offer regional hubs or connect to hubs to promote uh, for our staff a little more of a live where you work basis that helps us to better manage and more efficiently manage our estate, reduce our impact on, Derek, on we, um, Derek, we talk carbon. About a, sorry, Derek, we talked a few times about sort of the estate itself. What are we referring to? Is it the is it the central government office estate, which is the sort of the 134 buildings? Or is it the entire overall office of state, which is, I think, is what I think. Just looking at my figures here, is 276 odd buildings, and does it also include buildings owned or leased by other departments and arm's length bodies? So, what are we actually referring to? Yes, we are. We are talking about the in, the entire central government estate, inclusive of arm's length bodies and the departments. Okay, so that's the 200 and 270 odd buildings. Yes. Okay. Good. Thanks. Keep, keep going. Sorry. Um, uh, as I said, in terms of the Connect 2s, uh, we, we want to take a, a more regional approach by using our estate more efficiently. Uh, and as uh, the nature of the reform that carries on as a result of COVID, the new ways of working uh, uh, that departments are, are adopting going forward, the estate needs to be very carefully considered in that to make sure that the estate is, uh, to the extent possible, optimal, optimized. In terms of the challenges that we faced since the committee last met, uh, we've been working off of single-year budgets and uh, um, uh, and uh, a scarcity of capital within the system, which has promoted us to use our in our investment strategy to tackle the things that we can do with the money that we have, as opposed to plan for all the things that we could do if we had money. Uh, and um, with with that chair, that that's a broad a broad a very short synopsis given the briefing that I gave last week and the paper that's before you. Uh, and we're happy to address your questions at this point. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Um, just when we were talking, we were talking about public se sector assets earlier on in those buildings as well. But what it doesn't include doesn't include the schools, the state, doesn't include the hospitals, the state, and doesn't include all the sort of the other water service and those sort of issues either. No, it doesn't include specialist estates such as uh, within the criminal justice system, prisons, schools, hospitals, and like that. We are talking about central government's office estate here. And during the, I think your office management strategy in 2012 indicated that £54 million pounds of leases were due, due to run out in 2022. Um, what percentage of these leases have been renewed and what percentage have been replaced by freehold properties? So have we bought out leases to buy buildings? Because you mentioned sort of several buildings at the beginning of your presentation. We Chair, we'll come back to you with with the specific detail of, of, of that. But Patrick, do you have a, a broad brush that you could offer the committee? Um, well, yes. Generally speaking, the the, the number of leaseholds has come down by sixty um, since 2014-15, um, and the number of freehold properties has gone down by twelve. So um, there is there is no. Sort of general practice of moving out of freehold into right. leasehold. If anything, it's 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 the op opposite. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, so the Northern Ireland Audit Office in 2017 report found that there were over 6,000 unused workstations in the Northern Ireland civil service, and they estimated that cost at about 17.3 million. Can you advise to the extent of which the reform of public management programme has addressed a significant and unnecessary cost? And how many, you know, it's difficult now with COVID, but how many workstations that there are now and what does it cost? And how does that compare? Look, how does Northern Ireland compare with the eight deaths per 10 employees target set out of the executive's asset management strategy? 
Chair, we, we need to be careful when we when we compare costs of the estate based on workstations for a number of reasons. It, it's a reason it, it was a reasonable metric when the audit office carried out that report because there was a, a sea of vacant uh, workstations that, that, that equated to uh, um, pounds and pence uh, that, is, that is wasted. However, um, what, what happens is if we, if we decrease costs by workstations, all we simply have to do is take workstations out of buildings, but the cost base remains the same. Mm -hmm. So we're very much focused in terms of reducing the total cost base of that asset base that 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 we we spoke about. Uh, the the reality is too those numbers cited within the report um, reflected pre Vez numbers. So there's uh, there was an exit uh, in Vez of circa twenty three twenty four thousand staff. Those numbers have gone up. And so that metric would actually look much worse than it actually than it is, um, because we have not reduced our space uh, as fast as we would have liked to. So basically, sir, the strategy is wrong because we shouldn't be comparing deaths against employees. What we should be doing is actually the building. That that's that's the the initial approach where we focus on workstations. We've now focused on more or less the cost per FTE. Because that, that's a measure of utility and efficiency uh, as well. But we're constantly measuring the actual cost base and the decrease of that cost base because that's real money across the entire central government uh, uh, estate. Okay. Right here. Okay. Sir Paul. Yes, thank you, Chair. And thank you for your presentation and your time here today. Um, Derek, can I ask? Uh, what does, what does this look like in a practical sense? So let's take one of the hubs. I know that the Connect2 hubs are expected to open in Balakelly and down Patrick this year, and I understand because I, I know what Balakelly looks like. I know the ground, the space there, the built development already there, and so on, and the rationale for, for being there in the first place. But So let's take, for instance, Bellamina. I know Bellamina very well. I live there. I grew up there all my life. What does, what does it look in a practical sense? Uh, Bellamina becoming a Connect 2 hub. Not to get parochial, but that's the one place I know. So, what, what does it actually look like? We have office space there at the present time that's occupied by central government. It, what it looks like is us making better use of this existing office space in Ballymena. In particular, in Ballymena, our plans are around County Hall, utilising the space within County Hall better so that at, at, at no additional increased cost, save the money it takes for us to do the minor refurbishment, uh, we can make better use of the asset in County Hall. Now, we are looking at the Connect 2s in a phased uh, manner uh, and it's really the starting point uh, for what we want to do because behind this um, is significant rationalization that has to happen in Balamina as well. So initially as a result of COVID and we want to prevent the need for civil service to be so heavily reliant on big large centralized offices in Belfast City Centre, rather we can manage uh, risk associated with pandemics which are real uh, that, that we have to live with in terms of business continuity by having a more dispersed population that can, that's able to work remotely. The Connect2 hubs fit in with that, uh, that approach as well. But that's, when, when I talk about what's happening in, in, in what will happen in Balamina County Hall, there's a longer term plan, as I said, for the rationalization of the estate in Balamina. And that's us working with the local councils and the chief executive to understand what their plans are for regeneration, what their plans are in terms of local government's office accommodation requirements so that we can work together to make sure that we're optimizing government's um, office estate together. So in Balamina, the connect to itself is us using our own freehold assets as efficiently as we can do. But in the longer term, there's a rationalization piece that needs to happen uh, across the region as well. Understood. Will these hubs, these geographical hubs, have specialism? Uh, a bit like the reform required in our health service, whereby if you need uh, a certain procedure, you will travel to a certain 
hospital which specialises in that. Do you foresee these hubs being specialised? Our approach, uh, our vision for these hubs is that there, every single NICS um, member of staff will be able to access these hubs where they're doing their work for their department, regardless of what that work is, from the location that best suits them, their role, their job role, and their their department. So no, uh, there, there's, it's, it's not within DOF's um, virus, if you will, to determine what work departments do from what areas. It's actually the other way around. They, they're, they're, the way they work is, de is determined to us and it impacts on our office of state. But what we've seen through the last 12 months in regards to COVID is this ability to work remotely and the Connect2 hubs offer the ability to limit the amount of travel associated with that and limit our dependence on large um, scale offices within Belfast City Centre. So, so, to, so reality tells me and what I've experienced through my constituency work is this. There was an office opened up in Bellamina and a new build uh, a Department of Communities uh, to do with uh, uh, welfare reform or, or welfare uh, payments. And when this, whenever this was opened, it was, it was earmarked as a local office for local jobs. And what we found very quickly was because of people's specialisms and, and work practice and experience, we had, a, we had a, a unique scenario whereby a department moved out to that building and most of their employment was Belfast based. And, and so you had a scenario where Belfast people were travelling to Bellamina, not that we wouldn't invite them, of course, and then Bellamina folk still travelling up to Belfast. And then when those Bellamina folk tried to, when those Bellamina folk tried to uh, transfer, if you like, to that Bellamina office, their line managers resisted because they didn't want to lose the experience and they didn't want to train someone else up. Uh, so you ended up having this really frustrating scenario where civil servants would have been passing people on the M2 motorway, going to a Bellamine office and they going to a Belfast office. And it just seemed perverse, but I understood how that happened. How, how will we be able to prevent the Connect2 hubs from becoming like that? Now, I think you've answered part of that by by saying that you know, if you're a civil servant working in Bellamine or anywhere for that matter, you can you can avail of a facility, but that in itself presents problems too with regards to structure and and uh, management, I suppose too. So where do we get the balance? As I said, as I said before, the hubs are open to all staff, and what we're doing is promoting the people who are living in Bellamine to now be able to work in a hub in Ballymena to prevent the need for that uh, as well. Now, based on job roles, uh, and this is something I, I need to make very clear to the committee, the, the job role in the departments determine whether that role can be performed remotely or not, but we are seeing a significant number of NACS staff working remotely now, so we know that there's a significant number of staff who, who can now live in the area that they work in or work in the area that they live rather um, in regards to um, the 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 other part of that question in terms of um, uh, the, the skills and that I, I I would come back to it that again it is it's it's very much um, focusing on on the the civil service as a whole anybody who's there can access access them and we are looking hopefully into the future where we can maybe even break down barriers between um, our arm's length bodies and our departments as well, depending on their uh, their operational virus as well. Okay. Have I answered your question? Yep. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank um, you. just a couple of announcements. I have to unfortunately step out for a couple of minutes, uh, if I can ask the uh, deputy to uh, stand over. And you will be aware that the... Resignation of the First Minister. <laughs> And you will be aware that the First Minister has announced her resignation and as her stepping down is, I think she's announced her resignation as the First Minister from the end of June and is stepping down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party by the end of May, I think. I just want you to be uh, aware of that. And if you wouldn't mind, Deputy, if you could uh, take the chair for a few moments. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I also now have to discover I have a, another meeting now starting at five o'clock for a few minutes. You can understand the political sensitivities, but if you were content to uh, yes, sure. chair with that, I would be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologise to the committee for that. But Gemma next. Okay, so we'll Stuart. call on Gemma next. Can she be brought on the spotlight, please? Chair and thanks Derek and Patrick for your presentation. Um, coming from one of the, I'm, I'm assuming it's one of the most rural constituencies, um, and it's definitely one of the furthest from Belfast. I really welcome the Connect Two hubs. And Derek, I'm going to get a wee bit local here, and I hope you don't mind. You might not even have the answer for me, um, but I'm just wondering uh, for an update on the Enniskillen Connect Two hub. Um, we did meet with the CEO of Mananoma District Council a couple of weeks ago, and we discussed it, but. Um, I'm just wondering, from your own perspective, um, have you got an update on it? Our, our talks with the council are, are ongoing, and we're looking at utilising and perhaps carrying out an asset exchange with the local council. Uh, they have a they have an interest in uh, one of our freehold assets, and if they can provide a suitable asset for us that that better meets their needs in terms of regeneration and, and where they would like to see footfall in the town, that. Um, those are the kind of discussions we're at. But as it stands right now, uh, we are continuing, even in the because we want to make sure that there's place for people to be able to work uh, when public health advice works. We're continuing with our work uh, and uh, looking to have um, uh, our the the barrack site, the old the old historic barrack site where the uh, office is. Uh, uh, potentially looking at utilizing that space a little better to meet the needs of, of people who are traveling uh, from from Inniskillen. Thank you. And I understand, um, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, obviously the distance from Inniskillen or even from Blakeground from to Belfast would put somebody off applying for a job in Belfast. So the data might have been a wee bit skewed, but was that taken into consideration? Um, the data, the, the location for how we located our connect coups, uh, as I said in the briefing, we used our we use our HR data for where our staff live and overlaid that the buildings that they're actually traveling to that their that their office is associated with, and then using ordnance survey, we created the commuter routes and the corridors uh, associated with that, and that that highlighted the the needs and the locations where they were. But one of the benefits that we are hoping to achieve is that by being able to work re remotely, more remotely, and by being, being able for people, for, for example, as the other member said, in Ballymena, who are traveling to Belfast, uh, and likewise uh, in, in more rural areas such as Balik and Inneskillen, that there is an opportunity now that they wouldn't be discouraged from applying for future jobs as well. And that addresses some of the issues um, that were even brought up from the, from the previous discussion uh, you know, in terms of the, the access to labor market and the talent pool as well, widens out to more rural areas. And again, it also helps us with our addressing regional imbalance um, as well, uh, and uh, in terms of access, uh, rural impact as well uh, and, uh, in dealing with this. So it is a benefit that the, we, we are working with our, our colleagues across departments to, to capture uh, and, and closely with our colleagues in Mix HR as well. Yeah, thank you, and I completely agree. Um, and I'm looking forward to the Connect Two Hub being placed in Enniskillen. Thank you. Okay, are you finished, Gemma? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jim. Jim Alster. Yeah. Um, I think I read that the ambition of the strategy was to reduce the net cost of managing the estate by a hundred million by 2022. How's that going? Uh, the the net cost associated with with the estate uh, that 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 I believe came from the softy report, uh, and uh, that is referring to the net cost of the total government estate, inclusive of health and education assets as well. Uh, I can only report on how it's going in regards to the office estate. In regards to the office estate, how's it going? Yes. Um, challenging, challenging. We, we've the the past uh, three years in particular, 
uh, single year budgets and a scarcity of capital have, have made it quite challenging. And gains that we have made, and as I alluded to in my briefing, uh, are, are being eroded. Uh, and in many respects, we feel like we're, we're running hard to stand still. Have However, you made any reductions that, in the net cost? Yes, there has. Yes, there has. Just uh, tell us those. Our, uh, the, the net cost, uh, of, of the, the total cost of uh, property in, uh, as um, outlined in the audit office's report, Patrick, what's the... The number. Yeah, I can. I, yeah. The, the audit office um, noted a, an annual property cost of ninety five point seven million in twenty fourteen fifteen. Yes. And um, yeah. the latest data that we have relates to twenty nineteen twenty, and it's ninety one point four million pounds. So it's there. It's it's not a it's not a an, a, an enormous decrease in the cost base. Um, and in and the I intervening think, years, was there any reduction? Um. But sorry, between which years? The 2014, the, the start, the base year, and and where we are now. Um. Yes. So the the if we 2013 14, the actually the cost was around 103 million. 2016 17, it was 88 million. 2017 18, it was 88 million. 2018 19, it went up to 91 million. And 2019 20, it went up to 91 million. So. If anything, it's it's you know stagnated and then it's starting to go a little bit backwards. But there are a, there are a couple of um, projects in there which probably skew the figures a bit, and, and one of them would be the James House project where um, we purchased James House and the gas works, and it's in the process of being fitted out. Now, when it is fitted out and, and occupied, it will save two point eight million pounds per year. Um, similarly, Orchard House is is being refurbished, and whenever that's Occupied, and um, that'll that'll take another one million pounds out of the, out of the cost base. So, um, yes, there has been some stagnation, but there, you know, equally there are projects underway which will deliver more savings. So, with the reduced civil service following the exit scheme, and therefore reduced demand, nonetheless, there has been virtually no reduction in the cost of managing the estate. I, I think that it, it's a. Um, I think on the one on the face of it, yes, you could say that. But actually, it, um, if you unpack it a little bit, if if the the lease exits and other um, exits from freehold property hadn't taken place, I think we would be looking at very different numbers, which would tell a, a, a more sorry tale. Um, so the the other the other difficulty is. Um, to make these savings, you really need some some capital in order to make them. It's it's not we don't really have a freehold estate that lends itself to, um, really just um, inserting additional people, if you want to put it that way. I mean, the, our freehold estate tends to need modernised, and that will require funding. Is it any part of your job to oversee disposal of surplus assets? We would make recommendations as to what assets would become uh, that, that would be disposed, and they go into the then the disposal process that is managed by our colleagues in LPS. So, in the last five years, for example, what quantum of assets have been disposed of? I can get back to you with the, the exact detail of the the number of office estate assets that have been disposed of in the last five years, freehold office estate. Have you any idea? Uh, there's there's smaller assets out within the region. There's I know there's one significant office al alpha asset in Belfast that's been disposed of in the in the last couple of years as well. Um, uh, I I don't have the exact detail, but my colleague is trying to pull that up right now. And is that income? reinvested in the program or just go into the big black hole? Uh, the, 
We've been operating off of a, a reducing budget baseline for the last four years, uh, both in terms of property controls. So many of the interventions that we are, are dealing with are to be able to meet forthcoming budgetary pressures within the department uh, and elsewhere. Uh, the savings do not come to the program for reinvestment. In terms of arm's length bodies and others using government offices, is there hard charging of that out to them, or how does that work? Yes, for arm's length bodies, uh, for arm's length bodies, the charges are, are hard charged that they pay. They they pay a square meter rate based on the actual cost, and that's recovered to the department. To the individual departments. No, that those costs are recovered by the Department of Finance who offer the space. And is that in all senses satisfactory? The hard... Have you a view about that? I do know that it's in line with managing public money. Do you think there is any need for change in that? Hard charges promote a behaviour that make uh, businesses and organisations uh, think carefully about the, the, how they spend their money. Uh, and um, the managing public money, um, the managing public money in Northern Ireland, it promotes hard charging as a cost recovery vehicle. Uh, uh, among government departments and, and its arm's length bodies. So if we're in a situation where no department using the property uh, that belongs to the government is charged for that, what incentive is there for them to make any savings if they know that the Department of Finance will always pick up the tab? I, I don't think that's an, uh, entirely... Uh, accurate. It, the, through the budgeting process, the, the arm's length bodies get uh, a defined amount of money of which they have to cover their accommodation costs uh, oh. with that money. And um, if they need to make efficiencies within their own organization, they will need to act efficiently in regards to how they, they manage their own office footprint as well. So uh, the hard charging um, promotes uh, the behaviours that we, that we would like to see in terms of efficient use of property assets in the public sector. But if, for example, I take this department just at random, if the Department of Communities was hard charged for the premises it uses, would that not cause it maybe to be more efficient? The the department is looking at the charging models and how and how cost recovery works for a variety of its services uh, across the department right now. Uh, and my predecessor, who joined you, Stuart Barnes, I wouldn't want to steal his thunder in terms of uh, how progress is going on that. Are you saying that it might change? It sounds to me as if you're. It sounds to it's me. Something that, it sounds sorry. to me as if you're in favour of the change, but are a little timid about saying it. Uh, hard, charging, hard charging has many benefits for some departments and many drawbacks for other departments. Uh, what our job is in terms of RPM is driving down the total cost of the asset base and that's what we're focusing on is, is driving down those costs. The, the, the model in terms of charging for the assets that is, that's something that is being discussed among finance directors, I know, constantly. Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim Wells? Um, let's move away from Balamina and the uh, late fees. No. Uh, there seems to be a, an antrum centric uh, view in this committee. Um, do you need to go back to the drawing board completely? I take it that perhaps that you could be speaking to us from your home? Certainly, almost all of the civil servants that have spoken to us today have been speaking from their home. 
and the radical change that we've seen as a result, as a result of coronavirus has shown that a huge swathe of the civil service no longer needs to commute into Ballymena, Belfast or whatever in the morning to do anything. Now, you, you couldn't possibly have seen this coming. So I'm, I'm, there's no criticism here. This has been a complete revolution for all of us. If you'd asked me this time last year what Zoom meant, I would have looked at you. If you'd asked me what Teams or Webex, I'd have just, or Starleaf, is it, which you're on at the moment, I'd have looked at you quizzically and said, what on earth is this very senior servant, civil servant talking about? Now, given that radical change that we've all witnessed, do you need even half of what you have in terms of stock of buildings? Do you even need a third of it? And have you had that radical conversation with uh, your, your underlings or your, the staff below you and the one or two above you to see, has this all been totally changed? Has the, wool, has the rug been pulled out under the feet of all those who own government buildings? That, that is an excellent question. And the answer to it is yes. And that is why we're refreshing our investment strategy. We have our utilization data across the entire estate that shows how the civil service interacted with the estate pre-COVID. And based on, that, based on that data, we're very confident that we can take 40% of the estate out without affecting without affecting business uh, as usual. Um, when we add on the new ways of working and the impact of what, what you suggested, that, that we are more able to work remotely and the, the reality that there's a new policy being developed for, for remote working as well, we believe that there are further gains in that. But without really understanding how departments are going to return or what the no new normal looks like, uh, we're reluctant to go beyond um, uh, the, a 40% reduction in the estate, which is quite drastic in itself. But um, I believe that, that that is the starting point. And as uh, information over the next six and nine months evolves, and we understand how departments are going to utilize their estate going forward, how remote working is going to be embedded within the operations of departments, we will be looking to reduce our footprint drastically. Which is, which is good news. Have you or do you plan to do a survey of the staff working in these buildings to see how many of them would opt for a complete work, remote working regime or a hybrid, three days in, two days out, or uh, some other uh, form? I, I mean, I know I, this is probably a bit early to be asking this question because many of them are still working remotely as we speak. But is there any plans to carry out any in-depth research to see what the reaction to that will be? Some will be widely enthusiastic about it. And some... You got a quorum? Yeah. So, some will be wildly enthusiastic and some will miss the office dreadfully. Uh, I've never taken up the opportunity to use Starleaf because I, uh, how, could I, how could I forgo the chance of meeting these wonderful people on the Finance Committee on a weekly basis? I mean, it'd be terrible. Others, like my colleagues from Balik and Castle Wellen, or Castle Derg uh, and Dunloy, have decided to abandon this building. They don't want to meet us anymore at all. They're perfectly happy to sit back in their palatial mansions in the west and the north of the province and not deemed to meet us at all. They're happy with that. So have, have been, been serious about it. Have you started the, 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 the research that is going to be needed to find out what do the tens of thousands of civil servants feel about this option? Yes, we've already carried out two significant surveys. Uh, we, we, we changed the annual people survey. We worked closely with NISRA to capture that, that in fact, data set, to understand how much staff would be keen to continue to work from home, how many would look uh, for a blended approach, uh, uh, as you suggested, or a hybrid approach, and how many wanted to return to the office. Uh, and it told, um, it, it told uh, a very, very, it gave us a very, very clear picture. There is overwhelming support for continued remote working on a blended base. And that support is also echoed by the departments as well within the senior management teams that, that, that a, a, a return to operations that uses a more blended approach. That's what's given us the, the understanding of, of the potential impact into the future on the estate. We've also carried out um, a qualitative survey uh, within the Department of Finance across all departments 
that really got to understand what the lived experience of our staff were during this remote period. And it highlighted uh, aspects such as, uh, the, you know, it freed up more time for them for family time and eliminated the commute cost savings associated with commuter costs, but also highlighted some very, very negative and dangerous things in regards to isolation and mental health. And that's something that um, the, the NICS is taking very seriously in terms of uh, uh, understanding that as well. But there is, we've done the research, there is overwhelming support for continued remote, remote working on a blended basis. That's extremely interesting. Uh, and I'm delighted that you've sort of stolen a march, as it were, and, and even started that research, um, because I, I, I think every government agency will be having the same conversation with its staff. Uh, and I, I, I've had people who will never want to darken the door of an office again, and people who, dri who mix, miss the social contact with staff and managers uh, dreadfully. And I suppose that, that relationship is almost uh, directly in, uh, in relationship to how much trouble they have com uh, commuting into work every day. Those who pop around the corner are perfectly happy to go into the office, and those who have to fight their way into Belfast every morning could see it far enough away. And that has major implications for commuting, for transport, and, of course, for their, the inner city economy and our towns as well. Mm -hmm. If you take that large uh, footfall and spend out of our towns, that has implications well beyond government agencies and the civil service. So thank you for that. That's been very, very interesting. Okay, Jim, thank you. Uh, no other members are, are uh, uh, looking to come in, so it uh, remains for me then to say thank you, Derek and Patrick, for your time here today, uh, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Could I ask, uh, okay, could I ask the uh, Assembly Broadcasting to remove the officials then from the spotlight? Can I ask members, are there any other actions which we wish to take forward? Or are we content at the present time to move on? To content then, Chair, to write to the Department just about the issues that were raised, the um, yes. uh, quantum of assets disposed of and the refresh strategy and the surveys that Mr Wells asked about. Yep, happy enough to proceed in that form then, members? Yep, okay. Moving on then to, uh, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members to the spotlight for these agenda items? Uh, number 10 then, uh, subordinate legislation written briefing. Can I say that the Department intends to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Section 15.1 of the Government Resources and Accounts Act, Northern Ireland 2001. The proposed rule, the Whole of Government Accounts Designation of Bodies Order, Northern Ireland 2021, will enable the Department to request information from those departments and bodies designated in the schedule to the order and to pass the information provided to Her Majesty's Treasury for use in the preparation of the whole of government's account. Okay. Uh, this is an ongoing UK-wide exercise, of which Northern Ireland has been part since 2004-2005. The proposed rule will add the Forest Service and the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Abuse to the designated bodies. The rule is subject to negative resolution, assembly procedure, and is to come into effect by the 31st of May 2021. I seek members' views. Uh, any views? Any member want to raise any questions? If not, if members are content, I will uh, put it to the members uh, that the committee of finance, thirty fourth, sorry, that the committee for finance has considered the proposed statutory rule, the whole of government accounts designation of bodies order, Northern Ireland, twenty twenty one, and has no objection to the policy content and is content with the department to make the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Moving on then. Uh, subordinate legislation oral briefing number 11. Uh, can I say the department has made a regulatory, uh, sorry, a statutory rule under the rates Northern Ireland Order 1977. The rule is SR 2021-110, the rates regional rate order NIE 2021. Uh, is this an oral briefing? No. Um, it's actually in our table papers. It's Page 112 of uh, uh, table papers. Oh, so in our table papers, and is it is, is it an oral briefing? Yeah, it is an yeah, oral briefing. Is. Yeah, so Alan will. Uh, okay, that's why it's through me. It's in our table papers. Uh, okay, so uh, can I ask the assembly broadcast then to add the officials to the spotlight for this agenda item? Uh, it's uh, Alan Bronte. There he is. Okay, Alan, uh, can I welcome you? 
uh, on Starleaf to the committee here. Uh, Alan Bruntley, of course, Director of Rating Policy Division, Land and Property Services, Department of Finance. Uh, can I say that this session has been recorded by Hansard and the relevant papers are at page 112 of tabled items. Uh, so, without further ado, can I ask Alan to make a short opening statement on the rule? Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I, I won't really need to explain uh, this this order or the, this rule to the committee too much. That obviously the regional rates reflect the revenue levels determined within the executive budget, and you've heard already from Joanne and Jeff uh, earlier on this. So um, I won't need to keep you back on that too much. Um, the committee will be aware that the um, the, the, the budget uh, intends to freeze the regional rate, both for the domestic and the non-domestic regional rate. So the figures that are in this rule are identical to the figures that were in last year's, and that reflects the executive's intention not to raise any more money from regional rates this year. So the purpose of the rule is to set the amount of the domestic and non-domestic regional rate for the year ending 31 March 22. Um, and you'll see there where it's stipulated in the normal way of pence per pound. Um, and the, the committee will be aware that the rule uh, doesn't come into operation until the day after it's affirmed by the resolution of the Assembly. So there will be a debate on this rule. Chair. OK, thank you very much, Alan, uh, for that very succinct and brief uh, uh, response. So thank you. Uh, any members want to ask any questions? If we're okay and we're content, uh, can I say thank you uh, to the official? Uh, can I ask then members to uh, be brought back into the uh, spotlight? Uh, the rule is to come in, as Alan said, the rule is to come into effect on the day after it's affirmed by the Assembly. This is scheduled for Tuesday, the 4th of May 2021. The rule stipulates the regional rate for domestic and non domestic property expressed in pound, pence per pound for the 2021-22 rating years Alan has outlined. Uh, the committee considered a related SL1 on the 10th of February 2021 and agreed that it was content with the department to make the rule. Uh, the department has provided an assurance that the rule does not deviate from the original proposal as outlined by Alan. If members are content then, and no questions for Alan, I'll put it to the committee that the Committee for Finance has considered the statutory rule SR 2021-110, the Rates Regional Rate Order Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the report of the examiner of the statutory rules, recommends that it is affirmed by the Assembly. Is this agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, then. Thank you very much, Alan, for your time. Uh, Thank you. Can I ask the Assembly Broadcasting Team then to remove Alan from the spotlight and then to add all members to the spotlight for the remainder of the meeting? Thank you very much. Moving on then, members, to correspondence. Uh, the correspondence index is at 12.1. Uh, members are asked to note the index of the six received items of correspondence on page 416. Uh, I'll go through them. Include youth, strive programme and essential skills. Can I say that members are asked to note on page 418 a copy of correspondence from Include Youth, youth to the Minister for Finance highlighting the funding gap between the end of peace and the start of peace plus members are also asked to note on page 422 a copy of correspondence to the minister for the economy highlighting the end of lottery funding for the essential skills program provided by include youth are members content to note if so say agreed agreed, agreed. Uh, committee for the economy then at 12.4 banking uh, say uh, can i say that members are asked to consider at page 425 a response declining to involve the Finance Committee in the Committee for the Economy engagement with UK Finance, but suggesting a concurrent meeting with the Committee for TEO and Committee for the Economy to discuss the work of the High Street Task Force and post-COVID recovery, including the role of the banks, on the, and that's on the 16th of June 2020. So can I ask members, are they content to await an invitation from the Committee for the TEO? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, can I say then, moving on to 12.5, Committee of Health Reclassification Issue, can I say that members are asked to note on page 47, 437 
sorry, 437. A copy of correspondence to the Department of Finance highlighting concerns relating to the reclassification from close contact to non-essential retail of Lemonade Wigs Limited, which provides services to people who have undergone cancer treatment. The business in question has been asked by LPS to repay uh, 2500 or for this to be subtracted from any further COVID support payments. Can I ask our members content to note the correspondence and to raise when LPS briefs on the 12th of May 2021. Is this agreed? Okay. Uh, 12.6 Memo of Reply to the Public Accounts Committee Report. Can I ask members uh, to note page 442, a copy of a memorandum of reply from the Department of Education in respect to the PAC report on special educational needs. Can I ask our members content to note as this will uh, will be taken forward by either the PAC or the Committee for Education. Uh, are members agreed? Agreed. Okay, moving on then, 12.7, the Audit Committee, the role of the Audit Office Accounting Officers. Can I say to members uh, to note uh, at page 451, a copy of correspondence to the Minister seeking his views on a raise research paper on the role of Accounting Officers in Audit Office in relevant jurisdictions. In Northern Ireland, the Department appoints the, the Audit Office Accounting Officer and agrees the accounts for the Audit Office with external auditors, which it has hired prior to submission to the Audit Committee. So, are members content to note pending publication of the related Audit Committee report in the autumn? Are members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, and then at 12.8, the composite request. Uh, members are asked to consider the composite re request at pages 470. Can I ask, is the committee content with that request in that it is accurate and complete record of the committee's information requests? If so, is that agreed? Agreed? Okay. Moving on then to the forward work programme. Uh, Mr. Mr Chairman, can I just ahead? raise an issue that Jim meant to raise? Or maybe he did and I missed it when I was out. He raised the question about how many departments are funding the Northern Ireland centenary from within their own budget, and he suggested, and I, I seconded, that we would we would write to the departments and ask them. Now, I don't know whether we write to DFP or write to the nine departments individually. I'll leave that to, to the clerk to decide the best way forward, because I think it's, it is important if departments are spending significant sums within their own budgets that that is revealed, given the fact we know there's nothing centrally being spent apart from those coming from the Northern Ireland Office. Okay. Is, is the committee content, Chairperson? Yep. Is that agreed? Uh, Chair, you... Chair. Okay, Phil, come on ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I have no difficulty with any uh, MLA wanting to seek that information. I, I don't see it the job of this committee uh, to do it. I mean, we, we have, you know, we, we can ask ministers, we can write to ministers, we have written questions. You know, if either of the two gems want to find out, uh, the answer to that, what other departments are doing in terms of particular specific spending, you know, there, there are many ways to find that out. I, I just don't see it. You know, the, the job of this is to the job of this committee is to scrutinise the budget, the overall budget, uh, and you know, as I say, I, I don't think we would be supporting that at all. Okay, Phil. Just before you come in, can I just say that? Yeah, I get your point about getting information in other guises and other ways, and our forums, even minister or ministerial questions. I suppose, if, uh, uh, can I say the interest of this for me is the fact that departments then may have to make changes to their budget submissions in order to cater for uh, anything that they do in any department. And I suppose that's a question that I think this committee would find interest in. Uh, but but I'll, I'll hand over to Jim. You want to come in on this again? Yeah. Yeah. Far be it from this committee to seek information on how finance is being spent on this important issue. Uh, it's deeply offensive, what has just been said, because, as I said in the previous committee, we have always stood by the right of everyone to celebrate the decade of centenaries. Whether we wanted to attend or support it or not, we felt it was right that money would be used for that. When we come to one of the last aspects of the decade of centenaries, have, there having been consensus throughout the 12 years that this has been going on, we find that even requesting, even asking the committee to request how much money is being spent, not, not asking for a penny to be spent, but asking what has been spent is immediately blocked. Now, how on earth can we go, go forward, particularly with today's news, as an Assembly doing the best for the, committee, for the country, 
when even a request for information to find out what's going on is blocked by one group. I mean, I absolutely despair if that's the way we're going to go forward as an assembly. Despair. Uh, just and again uh, through you. I mean, Jim obviously wasn't listening to my contribution. I'm not ask. I'm not stopping Jim requesting any information. That he's entitled to do that. I mean, he's, he is well aware because we, we've been told on numerous occasions that the NIO are spending three million uh, on that issue. So I mean, he is aware of the of money that has been spent, and I'm not stopping or blocking Jim from seeking information that he requires. But he is requiring that information, not this committee. So, I mean, again, I don't think this committee needs or be, wants that. It wasn't me. It was Jim Allister. Yep. Through the chair, please. Through the chair. Yep. So, uh, let's try and get to a consensus here. So, what we've basically has uh, two members here have uh, proposed and seconded that, uh, that we write seeking this information on each department and if they are, if they are spending money at all on the centenary. To me, the subject matter is not really the issue. It's about how they're spending the money if at all is the issue and how and where they're diverting cash and funds from to spend that money. So that to me means it's relevant to this committee. So I have no problems with the proposal or the seconder uh, of that proposal for that matter. Now, if, 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 if members are, are seeking to, to not have that letter sent seeking that information, I will bring it to a vote, but I, I would just ask the members to, you know, because I do also abide by the principle of, look, if there's information to be out there, why shouldn't this committee uh, seek and, and to find out that information if it's financially related to this committee? I believe in this test it is. Uh, but again, if I have to, uh, I'll bring you back in, Philip, or anyone else for that matter that wants to speak on this. Uh, you, you, hear what I, you hear what I say, Philip? I, I'm just asking if you're happy and content to move on in that principle. I'm, but I'm not there, and I, and I, I don't agree with your assertion. The job of the department or the community uh, is to scrutinise the financial spend of the community's department. So therefore, it's, it's their job. The job of the infrastructure committee is to scrutinise the budget of the infrastructure committee. Therefore, it's their job. No, our job is the overall budget, which what, about allocations given to departments, how they spend that particular allocation, and the scrutiny of that is for that particular committee, not this committee. Okay, I hear your views. Anyone else want to come in on this? Chair, uh, uh, yep. if I, if I just you, ask, yeah. uh, I, I unfortunately had to duck out and take a phone call for the start of that. Do we have a written proposal for what information we're actually being asked to request? Uh, Matthew, very simple. Uh, during the, he the earlier hearing, Jim, a Jim asked what centrally had been allocated for the centenary. Uh, and then he asked what, depar what had departments set aside, and the officials said they didn't know because it was being spent within their overall budgets, and they didn't necessarily have to inform the, the DFP. So Jim asked, could we find out? Now, this is revolutionary. We're just asking how nine de what nine departments, if anything, are setting aside for the centenary. Now, I, you know, I, I would, if the question was how much was being spent on Gaelic Athletic Association and Irish language, I would be the first to second and say it's important that the members who want that information receive it. It has far more, uh, uh, far more uh, import if it comes from this committee where we get a coordinated response rather than a series of assembly questions, which, as you know, could take months to answer uh, from experience. So it's simply a request for information, not a political point we're trying to make. And I'm very disappointed, very, very disappointed that even that is seen as a bridge too far for some members of this committee. Very disappointed. Okay, can I ask just, can I ask, the, sorry, Matthew, you want to come back in again? Are we asking for it as a, a, in a specific bit of correspondence or are we just requesting it yeah. from the DALO? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the clerk in here to see would we, be, would we be writing to the Department of Finance requesting I that for information? I think, Chairperson, we would write to all the departments. The officials have already told us they don't have that information, right, nor okay. would I expect them to. So we would write to each of the Dallos um, and ask them uh, the question about how much money each department is setting aside for the commemoration of the centenary of the Foundation of Northern Ireland. And can we add to that then, that, and, and how was this money found? Yep. Would that be okay? From? Yeah. Uh, and uh, just I, I personally, I would say that's different from... That, now that is straying into territory that I don't think is the job of the committee, and I'll tell you why. If, they, if we were writing to the finance department to ask the finance department about budget, and I'm not, I have no 
I mean, this is in no way a political statement about the merits or otherwise of spending on centenary. But if we were writing to the finance, the, our finance DALO, the department that we hold to account to ask for that information, that would be one thing. But we don't go to every department. I routinely and ask them for information on on spending lines on their areas as a matter of course. That you know, that's nine different bits of correspondence, nine different information requests. There are a range of things we could ask for them. So I just, if that does feel uh, excessive, to be honest. Okay. Any, uh, any other member want to come in here before I'm, I will put this to a vote? But but yep, come on ahead, Alicia. Uh, just through the chair, uh, and I'm of the same opinion as well too. Uh, and I'm actually disappointed, you know, that uh, whenever uh, Mr. Wells actually makes a comment like that, this is revolutionary, and then he, he attaches sort of a request like it again too to the Irish language, or like in a sense like it uh, politicises the language as well too. Something of which I'm very committed to myself, but I don't see it in the sectarian context, not in the slightest. But uh, what I do say is that without doubt, this is the work of other departments. And I often see the same situation arriving in, uh, arising in council, you know, that where you have individual councillors requesting, say, of officials, which is that they should have dealt with directly before ever a council meeting. And the same is that for Mr. Wells as well, or Mr. Alistair. But if they require this information, go ahead and write to the various departments uh, rather than expecting the finance committee to take on that responsibility itself as is not part of our work in that respect. Quite okay. frankly, it's the subject matter you object to. It had any other issue under the sun, you would have agreed to it, but it's the sheer bigotry. No, no, I, I'm going to. Right, so we've, all, we've, all had our, we've all had our speak on this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this down now. And can I ask, can I ask then, Jim, if you want to make this a proposal? Yes, I make a proposal. I, I certainly second it. And then we'll put it to a vote. So all those in favour and right. Sorry, Chair. So I beg your pardon, Chair. Just right, to then. advise that um, Mr. Cantney, before he left, advised me in line with uh, Standing Order 1156 that he was delegating his vote to uh, Mr. O'Toole. So okay, good. Right. Thank you. Right, that, pardon. That's very important to get in. Uh, thank you very much. Well so uh, it's been proposed and saying that we write to the departments, as has been outlined by the clerk and by others. So can I put that to a vote? All those in favour and writing in that, guys? Uh, all in favour say aye. 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 Two. Two. And all against? No. One, no. two, three, four. And no. Mr. That's four with Pat's vote also included. That's five. Is that the case, Mr O'Toole? Sorry, Chair. Yep, go ahead. No, yes. Can I just say, uh, once that vote's been recorded, Chair, put on the, I'd like to put on the record, I'm not opposed to us requesting information about NI centenary spending from the Department of Finance I am opposed, and the proposal that we voted on is that we as a committee for finance write to every single executive department asking for that information. That, to me, uh, is not, um, it does not seem a proportionate uh, request, given that it's open to any MLA to ask questions by a correspondence or assembly questions. If it was specifically asking it about of the finance department, I would... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Matthew. Uh, you clarify that very well. We're, we're, so we have the figures there now. We're going to move on. Okay, members, okay, moving. Uh, happy enough, Clark? Yep, yep. yep. So moving on then, forward work programme. Can I say the draft forward work programme is at page 484? Can I ask members, do members have any comments on it? If, Can I just say yes, Matthew, come on ahead. Thanks, Chair. I, I mean, one thing, it's just a general comment. I don't know if others, we've been having really good sessions. It's just a general comment which is that I know we had our briefing today, um, which was carried over from last week, which was correctly because we hadn't had a full some written briefing. But we are, um, we're slightly on the sort of four, I think four different sets of oral briefings is, we're, I think personally, I think we're pushing at the bounds of our being, all of us being able to properly prepare for questions that are serious in, in terms of scrutiny. So I just think we should be thinking about that in terms of, you know, when we look at individual uh, here, you know, um, uh, evidence sessions, whether, you know, three or four different sets, well, th three possibly, four can feel a bit much. We, I know we have, we're due to have four next week and, and, and they're four very important ones, but I just think it's worth us thinking going forward whether uh, four is a bit much uh, purely because I think it involves... I think it prevents us being able to do really 
serious scrutiny sometimes. The point well made, Matthew. Okay, we'll, we'll take that on board. Thank you. Uh, so, moving on then, the clerk suggests that the briefings from NIPSA and HR Connect be rescheduled to the autumn, when both organisations would be free to comment on the PAC and the NIAO report on capability and capacity in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Uh, is that that solves a part of that problem, Matthew? Uh, are, are we agreed? <laughs> Are we agreed? And if we then, if we are agreed, then are we content with the forward work programme as it's amended? Agreed. Great. Okay. Any other business then? Can I uh, uh, advise members that an additional single channel, fully virtual meeting facility is about to be brought on stream at the assembly? This will allow a limited number of committee meetings to overrun, if necessary. Uh, Mana to your ears, I know, and continue to be broadcast. In addition, from this autumn, uh, room 21 uh, will be equipped with an additional meeting room. Both of the above will allow more meetings to happen simultaneously. Uh, the limit on the number of simultaneous meetings will therefore probably be in future more related to the availability of members uh, and the, the, the aspect of cutting people in half and the impact on core. Uh, is there any, uh, so members clear on that then? If members are clear, is there any other business from members? If, if no further business then, it leaves me then to say that the date and time and place of next meeting will be Wednesday the 5th of May 2021 at 2pm in this Senate chamber and on Starleaf. Okay members, thank you very much for your attendance. I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the